all who are in attendance, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county's YouTube page. Calling the roll, Mr. Miller. Here. Mr. Tuma. Here. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is absent. Mr. Gallagher. Here. Mr. Fry. Here. Ms. Baker. Here. Ms. Turner. Present. There is a quorum. Also like the record to reflect that council members Stevens and Sweeney are in attendance. Thank you very much. And has uh, next item on the agenda is number three, public comment. Has anybody signed in for public comment? No, Mr. Chair, no one has signed in. Okay, and uh, next item is approval of the minutes from October 3rd, 2022. Do we have a motion regarding this? I'll make this that motion. Minute? Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the minutes as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Ayes have it, and the minutes from October 3rd, 2022 are approved. Okay, next on the agenda is matters referred to the committee. Item A, Resolution 2022-0381. Resolution number 2022-0381, amending the 2022-2023 biennial operating budget for 2022 by providing for additional fiscal appropriations from the general fund and other funding sources for appropriation transfers between budget accounts, <clears throat> excuse me, and for cash transfers between budgetary funds to meet the budgetary needs of the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you very much. Director Merriman, welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is David Merriman. I'm the Director of Health and Human Services. I'm here on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services and County Executive presenting a request to appropriate funds from the Social Innovation Fund. I want to acknowledge that I'm not presenting the contract at this time, just the appropriation. Any decision out of this meeting will enable us to bring the contract forward that will be a very different presentation. I also want to acknowledge that Councilwoman Yvonne Conwell, Chair of the Health and Human Service Committee, invited me to present on this program two weeks ago. And so some of the information may look familiar, but I want to get into the appropriation. There is a PowerPoint, if I can do the PowerPoint. Please proceed. Thank you. So uh, the, the project that we're, we're asking for this funding uh, for is a multi-systems public-private partnership that will enable us to launch a workforce program tar targeting participants in the Ohio National Guard. I need to acknowledge that this is a use of pay for success financing for which the county was the first county in the United States of America to utilize. This project will be very different from that program in that this is workforce focused to help individuals that are enrolled in the Ohio National Guard eligible to go to college or a training program to help those individuals get in to college or training to stay in that college or training program through to the point of completion. The project vision is for this public-private partnership of the Ohio Department of Higher Education and Adjutant General's Office to work with a provider that we procured through a competitive procurement that will serve guardsmen living in the Northeastern Ohio area. The goals of that project will be, um, laid, as laid out here, matriculation, entering school, term-to-term -term persistence, staying in school, and completion of a two- or four-year degree or completion of a training program. <clears throat> the deal itself is fairly straightforward, starting from left to right. Maycomb Capital <clears throat> has uh, agreed to issue a loan to Inside Track. Inside Track is a national nonprofit. Inside Track will be referred Ohio National Guardsmen from Northeastern Ohio. Those individuals will receive executive coaching services to help the Guardsmen explore higher education, either a training program or college to get into a higher education program, to stay in that program and complete that program. <clears throat> the Ohio Department of Higher Education will be following those individuals. They will report to us whether or not the individual has succeeded in those goals. And if they are successful, the county will make payment of success payments to Inside Track, who will then repay its loan with Maycomb Capital. Let me break down how that works. So as some of you may know, the county created the Social Impact Finance Fund 
in 2014. We did annual appropriations of a million dollars a year out of the Health and Human Service Levy Fund. That fund certainly currently sits at $5 million with human service levy dollars. And those funds can only be used under certain circumstances. Right now, those funds are unencumbered. So the Social Impact Finance Fund was established to leverage private investment in our social service system and sub subsidized through the county's levy. The funds can only be used when private investment will be leveraged, for which we intend to make success payments based upon that private investment. So on the deal, Maycomb Capital will serve as the investor. They will be making a $2 million loan to Inside Track. Inside Track will then provide the services. I want to acknowledge Maycomb Capital has already made one deal in Ohio. Uh, I don't have the specifics on it, but I know that it was uh, Franklin or Hamilton County. I, I will invite Maycomb Capital to the contract meeting and they can share more about their history in Ohio. The nature of the deal that they'll make is they'll make <clears throat> a loan of up to $2 million that will be used to provide operating capital that Inside Track will use to serve the Ohio National Guardsmen. Based upon the success, the county will repay Inside Track, who will then repay their loan. <clears throat> In terms of the contract, the Social Impact Finance Fund stipulates that it can only be used for performance based contracting, and there has to be detailed explanation on the outcomes that will be achieved, the provider's role, and how they will successfully achieve those outcomes using evidence based intervention and uh, a demonstrated performance targets. In the deal we've proposed, Inside Track will be the provider and the specific target population will be the Ohio National Guardsmen. The county's funds will only be used when a successful achievement has occurred, a successful outcome has occurred. occurred. In the Social Impact Finance Fund, there's a requirement of an evaluator that is independent and a, an objective entity that they do not have any stake in the achievement of the performance target <clears throat> and nor any conflicts of interest. In this deal, the Ohio Department of Ohio Education has agreed to be the evaluator. This is an innovation. The last time we used Case Western Reserve University, there was a cost associated with their role. Ohio National Guard, I'm sorry, the Ohio Department of Higher Education will serve that role for free. They will be using their own administrative data. There are no additional data collection requirements and it will be the Ohio Department of Higher Education reporting to us the success of the services. The nature of the outcomes that we're pursuing are matriculation. Again, the student has to be enrolled in at least, oh, thank you very much. Um, the student has to be enrolled in an institution of higher education. These have to be public institutions at this time. Uh, they can be a degree, I'm sorry, a degree bearing university or a training program. Term to term persistence is uh, the student staying in school quarter after quarter, and there is a cap on the number of term to term persistence payments that can occur. And then lastly, completion. There will be a priority given to individuals that are completing the programs, with the highest payments going to individuals completing a four year degree. Um, I'd like to just move on to reporting, and th there is a specific role in the legislation that requires for the fiscal officer to appropriate the dollars for there to be a cap on the amount of money that sits in the fund and for there to be annual reports. I also wanna acknowledge that there will be a governance committee associated with this project and I've invited council staff to sit in on that, uh, that committee if they're of interest. So I'd like to pause there and see if there are any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Questions by my colleagues. All right, if I may. <laughs> uh, Ms. Baker followed by Sweeney. Um, that's a lot of information in a very short period of time. So I'm just trying to digest some of it. Um, the last statement you just made was $5 million is the investment? The fund has $5 million. Okay. But the contract that we will be bringing with approval of this request will be $2.5 mil will be 2 million. So there will be a balance in the fund. Okay. Um, and I guess just some general questions, Ohio National Guard, why is it that we are um, selecting the Ohio National Guard over other maybe low income 
organizations or people that could be in greater need? So uh, we'll go into greater detail uh, on this point once we get to committee with the contract. But the Ohio National Guard worked directly with the Ohio Department of Higher Education to increase educational attainment within Ohio and specifically within the Ohio National Guard. There are many guardsmen that start a two or four year program that do not complete. In fact, uh, about 50% of certain degrees see, see uh, individuals follow all the way through to graduation. So the Ohio National Guard worked with the Ohio Department of Higher Education to come up with new strategies to help guardsmen to continue with their degree program and to try to complete the program within a four-year term so that there is no debt accru accrued by the individual that is, uh, that is in school. They uh, released a, uh, oh, they, I'm sorry, they attended uh, a conference where they found out about these pay for success strategies that leveraged private investment to create public-private partnerships where the private funds were utilized to create the operating capital and the government's role was to step in when success occurs. And they actually proposed this contract to the state several years ago, but it was not successful in getting any appropriation. They approached us because we were the first county in America to launch a pay for success project to ask us if we could help either with state appropriation or with guidance. I let them know that we had funds still available in the social impact finance fund and that workforce is our top priority. My belief is that this workforce program will be used to leverage placement of Northeastern Ohio residents into sector partnership positions, in demand jobs, and uh, training programs that will lead them to high wage jobs. And our, our feeling is that based upon the Ohio National Guard's track record of having this program and providing some supports in the scholarship, there just needs to be some executive coaching to have it go a little better. So the, I would add that, that uh, under this program, we don't have to provide any money for scholarships because we're taking advantage of an existing state program and, and what we're, so far, uh, National Guardsmen haven't uh, done all that well in completing college and, and uh, taking advantage of the program. So we're hoping that this program will enhance the effectiveness of that existing state program. But if they were chair, if they did take advantage, then it would then begin to cost us, is that right? That's correct. If uh, when Inside Track receives a referral from the National Guard, right. if they get that individual into college or a training program, they get a success payment. If their support leads to term to term persistence, they can get a success payment, although that will be capped. If that support and that coaching leads to the individual uh, completing the training program or college, they will get a success payment. Our funds are only used when success has been identified by the Ohio Department of Higher Education. But the success tier doesn't sound like success of the program. It sounds like a success of recruit. Right? That's correct. Thank you. Yeah, so it's, it's when the individual, when the resident is successful in getting in, staying in, completing their education, then we will make a success payment on their behalf to Inside Track. And is, did I hear you say there's also a success payment made just for the act of recruitment, even if they didn't finish the program? It's, it's not recruitment, it's enrollment. They have to get the student into college or a training program. Without any, any success yet? Well, without, at that point, having them start college is the first goal. We believe there are thousands of, of residents in Northeastern Ohio that could go to college for free, and they're choosing not to for some reason, and no one is walking them through that decision. Okay, that, that's good for now. Thank you. Councilman Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Director. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, excuse my pad. Uh, I had the privilege of having the presentation in the Health and Human Service Committee, and I was just thoroughly impressed. And the one thing that uh, caught me was the, the retired captain from the National Guard. When he came up here, just looked right at us and said, this is a mission-driven program for us. That mission-driven just sunk in my head we should have a lot more mission driven as a government and I look forward to having this being very successful as I've been talking to some of my colleagues and other folks uh, why is this program uh, going to be successful why other ones failed that's what I 
heard and I want to understand. It. I have an under, I have an idea, but I want to hear it from you through the chair. Uh, to the councilman through the chair, this program is going to succeed because of inside tracks ability to provide individualized one-on-one -on -one executive coaching to those guardsmen. Most participants in the Ohio National Guard are working. Many have families or they've just completed high school. And frankly, they've not figured out how or why to go to school. And what we believe is needed is for someone to guide them to get on an education path, to take advantage of this free scholarship that's available to them for a time limited period. And our, our understanding is each and every one of them has many difficult decisions to make. And, and Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Lamb, who came up here, really talked about these are, these are individuals serving our state, serving our country, and they're balancing that service with their personal responsibilities. So for many of them, they just, they just don't see how education fits, and they need someone to hold their hand walking them through. This is what it takes to get enrolled, and let me help you get through this program and get to, to school. Thank you, Director. I'm 0 for 2. I called up Morning and I called him a captain. He's he's Lieutenant Colonel. So he's not, he's a good guy. I'll shut up. Uh, a couple more, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Just what I was impressed with was the selflessness of the five entities that came up. They weren't talking about how great their program is or the success of we're so good here. What I saw was five individuals that have different uh, roles in this journey, and each one talked about we want to get these individuals either a certificate a two-year or a four-year. As I said before, that just impressed the heck out of me. And my thought is, because we talked about coming up short in the appropriations mm -hmm. in the State House. And the State House is uh, not complicated, but it's a uh, you try to manage through the State House is uh, an art in yeah. some forms. To have our program be as successful as I hope it's going to be, it's going to lead to the appropriation in uh, budget year 23-24, and once we're done with ours, this could continue this in perpetuity, which is what we're trying to do. And at one point, I just want it to be normal. We're going to do a lot of catch-up right now. But once we get them all ca caught up, it's going to be part of their attractiveness to join the Ohio National Guard. To say, hey, come on in here. We'll be able to not only have you serve our country, but have us have the opportunity to graduate. And it's just something that is, I'm fully supportive of. I want to thank the chairman for giving me the opportunity to chat about it. Thank you. Well, uh, Councilman, thank you for your support. Success breeds success. I believe if, if this program is given the chance, it will succeed, and the state will have to look at whether or not they want to leverage the model to make it a statewide program, which every guardsman serving our state should be given some form of executive coaching to help them get into school to balance their responsibilities. Because it's called what? The Ohio oh. National Guard. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Councilman Schron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, last week, I think we, we, uh, we passed a piece of, of uh, legislation that involved support for uh, kids uh, that were in that in-between area between colleges. And we found a way of, of this body pass something unique. You are asking us again to pass something unique, which is which is okay. When you when you stretch outside your your comfort zone, sometimes you do things that maybe you didn't anticipate were going to be there, and you are asking us to stretch outside of our comfort zone. Um, we are the only county in the entire state of the 88 counties that make sure that every dollar we receive in our veteran service commission goes back to the veterans. It's unique. Last week, uh, Sonny Simon, our colleague, made sure that we started a scholarship to allow people that if they're leaving one university and they have debts left over, not f borrowing debts, but parking debts and things like that, that doesn't allow them to get into school. And you are giving us one more way in which we should be encouraging uh, students uh, in this particular case. And I being a veteran, I see. I look out there and I see another one of my veterans' uh, buddies, Pat McLaughlin. Uh, I see a, a, a dad who's uh, uh, proud as a peacock because his son just got into fixed-wing flight uh, school out there, uh, uh, Mike Gibbons. And so I just cannot cheer on enough things like this. Uh, I, I can't even believe that we could be even having a second thought. If it fails, okay. But that's what, that's what innovation's about. And you're bringing us an innovative idea, hopefully, 
Um, we'll wake up our other 80, 87 counties and they too will do the same thing. So congratulations to you. I love innovation. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Just one if I may. Yes. Um, and I didn't come to the committee, so my questions might be redundant of what you've already heard. Uh, the Ohio Department of Higher Education is going to be the measurement piece. So what does success look like? Is this for um, a four-year degree? Is this a two-year degree? Is this trades? Is this um, mentoring, um, perhaps, uh, for plumbing? Or what, what does... What box do we check that says this is a success based on the Ohio Department of Education? Uh, to the councilman, woman through the chair. One, when we come forward with the actual contract, remember this is just the appropriation, the contract will follow. We will bring all the degrees that a guardsman can, uh, can utilize. Fine. And the policy just changed in this last budget that allows a guardsman to take their scholarship program to a credentialed training program. That's a, that's a first time, and they needed to do that a long time ago. Yes. But they now do it, and, and they, have, they have broadened the horizons, mm -hmm. and that's, that's part of what made us so excited and to the councilman's uh, perspective about individuals uh, you know, coming forward wanting to make this happen. I think a lot of it is all of us see these guardsmen contributing to our society, but I also see them playing a significant role in county operations. Like You think about the guardsmen that worked at the jail when our jail was under operating. Think about the guardsmen that provided food, food distribution with the food bank in the height of COVID. The guardsmen that provided medical care in the Wolstein Center. These are all Ohio National Guardsmen and they are doing security, they're doing logistics, and they're doing medical services. Yes, they are doing us a service. They are also developing skills and there are nursing programs. There are, there are manufacturing programs. There are medical programs and IT programs that they can take advantage of. And by the way, their guard time is giving them the skills and sometimes the credit. And all they need is someone to guide them through the process to get through to education. We'll bring all the education programs and credentials that are, um, that are allowable under Ohio National Guard and Adjutant General Office uh, policy. It's a decision on their part. Last thing I just have to say, at the end of the day, the guardsman chooses what they want to study and where they want to study it in a public university. We don't get to make that choice. Our choice is to serve and help them. And that's what we want to do. Well, I look forward to hearing more of those details. I, I appreciate it. It does look like a, uh, a fascinating program. Just would like to see the, the details behind the, the objective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Seeing none then, and, and we would like to uh, try to get this moved along so that we can get the contract introduced uh, after we know the appropriation is going to pass. So I would like to ask if one of my colleagues would like to make a motion to move resolution 2022 for second reading suspension. I'd be honored to move for a second reading suspension of uh, this, this article. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded to move resolution 2022-0381 to the full council with a recommendation for leadership to put it on the agenda for second reading suspension at the next council meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The ayes have it and the resolution is recommended. Thank you very much. Resolution 2022-0342. Resolution number 2022-0342, amending the 2022-2023 biennial operating budget for 2022 by providing for additional fiscal appropriations from the general fund and other funding sources for appropriation transfers between budget accounts and for cash transfers between budgetary funds to meet the budgetary needs of various county departments, offices, and agencies. Uh, Councilman Sean has requested to make an opening statement, and I'm going to recognize him at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a rare opportunity when bodies like the County Council uh, can do something that could impact our region, our state, our country, perhaps for years to come. Today's topic is that rare opportunity. We just also were uh, honored to actually recognize our veterans at, uh, in the National Guard with a program for, with millions of dollars that we just uh, move for second reading suspension. The concept of creating the Opiate Innovation Fund is to seek other alternatives than the path we are on. 
Today, we are only on a single path of spending over $100 million of opiate settlement money for treatment and care. Of course, treatment and care is critical, important, and a worthwhile goal. But on this path, we'll eventually have spent the entire $100 million plus and will be no closer to actually act activating real front end solutions and problem to this problem. All the settlement dollars from Northeastern Ohio ended up in Cuyahoga County and Subbit County. We became known as the Opiate Crisis Center for the entire United States. Well, how does the Opiate Innovation Fund differ? It will encourage fresh ideas, people working in labs, creative individuals who will have new ways to solve problems, the opiate problem with products, perhaps a process, software. Who knows what the answer will be? My colleagues say, what are the answers? That's not how innovation works. If anybody's ever been involved in the front end of an innovation idea. We are so fortunate to have four of the top hospitals in the United States all centered in one single city. Metro, Cleveland Clinic, UH, and one of our forgotten ones, the top, one of the top veterans hospital, all of which have to be content with dealing with the opiate problem. All these hospitals have entrepreneurship programs, development embedded in their operations. They can be a test bed for helping to solve this problem. We, as a county council, even created a divergence center. What a perfect place also to be testing solutions where ideas can flourish. Our region's top two economic drivers, the medical and the manufacturing community, fully, fully line up with why this could work and why it should work. Just so that people don't have a misconception, this is a long process. No one's gonna sit here and tell you this is gonna be easy. Today's conversations are about seeding the Jumpstart Fund to open the, the money. The next step, as uh, Major Shaw, who worked in this area, will tell you as former GCP and entrepreneur uh, in resident out at uh, Cleveland Clinic, the $10 million would grow to 15, 15 to 25, grows to 50 and so on and so forth to put us in a position to be actually impactful. Not spending the first 10, only growing it so that you can actually have an impact by doing big ideas. Some of my colleagues actually during the last time raised the question, well, what about the, the funds? Are, are they gonna be secured? We're blessed with the probably the largest uh, investments in the country with investment managers running things like the Cleveland Clinic or Cleveland Foundation with over $4 billion in, in assets. Clearly one of the most secure places that would be out there. And not only that, they have extended themselves to say, and you'll hear it today, that they will do this for free because they believe that much in trying to solve this problem. Would additional funds from across the country or other places or private investors come to, uh, to write a check to uh, the Cuyahoga County? I don't think so. Would they write it to a Cleveland Foundation because it's an impartial third party without being part of the government general fund? Yes. And then the last phase, which is phase four, which is the actually identifying of projects, processes, things like that to be creative and be innovative. I was also asked, well, why would the private sector, how could they do this? How could they do this when uh, the government sector can't? I don't know if, if any of you have had a chance to watch, uh, there was a recent uh, documentary on the creation of SpaceX. People said, oh, every single person of high level from NASA went to Washington DC and said, this is a ruse. It was a waste of time. There was absolutely no way the private sector could do what can be done by government. Because at that point in time, only Russia, Chinese government, and the United States government had ever launched astronauts into space. Don't tell the private sector they can't do something because sure enough, SpaceX, if anybody has paid attention, has launched, they are now the Uber vehicle to take people to the space station soon to go to Mars, and on the way, they're going to create a platform 
uh, in, on the moon. The private sector is creative, innovative. They told them, why can't we reuse the missiles and the rocket ships? And guess what? SpaceX does. We never did that. No one else had ever done that. And what does it mean? SpaceX took the cost of an astronaut and cut it to one-tenth the delivery cost that it was taking. Will there be failures? Of course there will be. That's just what innovation is all about. But anybody who knows anything about Thomas Edison had 900 and some ways of how not to make a light bulb. He didn't have a single failure. He just had different ways to try to get there. So will we have a solution in nine months or six months? Of course not. This is, as I laid out the idea, this is gonna be a growing process. It's gonna be a growing step. But we as a body, we as a body have the ability to do something unheard of and very impactful. It will take us time. If we keep going down the path, we're never gonna solve the problem by just spending the dollars. Rather than being known as the opiate crisis capital, wouldn't it be remarkable if we became the opiate solution capital and these ideas came here? So thank you, Mr. Chairman, allowing me to speak. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to call upon Director Herdig, who will uh, shepherd us through the presentation. Good afternoon, um, Councilman Miller. I'm Paul Herdig, Department of Development. Thank you for the opportunity to come forward and discuss with this committee the administration's proposed opioid innovation fund. I say this to emphasize that we um, acknowledge the leadership of Councilman Schron, but also to make it clear this is something the county executive also firmly supports and the administration is putting forward this proposal because we believe it is a good and appropriate use of $10 million from the opioid settlement funds. We have appeared at a previous hearing and went um, briefly into the outline of the proposal. We are not going to go into great detail again today because we've secured a number of very prominent speakers to address the committee, and I believe their points of view are most important today. Um, I will ask while we're doing this if it's possible for Annie Rickers to go ahead and start sharing her presentation on page three. Um, Annie Rickers is our consultant, and as she's recovering from COVID, council staff is, is, has made arrangements for her to join us by Zoom at this time. Um, so we are um, seeing a, a schematic overview of the way the administration is proposing to set up this fund. Um, I should also note that today we're before you to discuss the appropriation, just as David Merriman spoke a moment ago about the very different proposal for pay for success. Should this appropriation advance, which we ask that you do advance it, we will return for a full hearing on the proposed funding agreement with the Cleveland Foundation. So there'll be a further opportunity to go into all the details of that funding agreement and relationship. Essentially, in very, in, in, at the highest level, our proposal is to place $10 million from the Opioid Settlement Fund in a special account with the Cleveland Foundation. As Councilman Schron indicated, the foundation has mechanisms in place to receive these types of funds, to safely and securely administer them, um, and you know, to be assured that they will be used as was intended. The second aspect of this is to assemble an advisory committee. We would look um, certainly to county council for um, a number of nominations to that advisory committee. The intent is to have experts both in the field of opioid prevention and innovation to serve in this committee. So that advisory committee can advise where the investment should be made. And the third piece of this is to have a program manager which will do some um, administrative work, some reporting, some actual management of the funds. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that there will be this advisory committee which will be reviewing each proposed investment of the funds um, before the funds are released or put into specific innovations. I would like to pause at this point before any of the other speakers come up to ask if there's any questions, you know, in terms of what the overall proposal is, what the status of it is, what the administration is recommending. Okay, please proceed. Not, I would like then to ask um, 
Our first speaker, Andy Ritkers, is a consultant that's been working with us in developing the outline for this fund. Due to the great number of other experts we have here today, Annie's going to keep her remarks brief, and I've asked Annie actually only go up to slide number eight in what she's going to speak about. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair? I'm sorry. I, I was just looking at some of the uh, notes here. So uh, if I could, just to the director, um, just could you go into, I, I know you want your speaker to speak, and I understand that, but could you just explain the program manager's role? Thank you. Um, and again, I will... Annie in a moment will go into a little more detail, but essentially this is a function of doing the actual mechanics of placing the investments, each of each investment that is decided by the advisory committee. So once the advisory committee recommends a certain amount of money be invested in some company, or as Annie will talk about, some money be used to pay for their early stage trials, the program manager will be in charge of actually mechanically making sure the proper legal agreements are entered into to record that commitment of funds and that the funds are, are paid out in the manner that was agreed upon. And they will then collect reporting on the use of those funds, including the outcomes that are recognized, the successes that are recognized by using the funds. So that's the essential function of the program manager. Is the program manager, is, is the vision to have a... Um, someone outside of county government doing that or an organization or an individual or how, how's that? Thank you, Councilman. The um, fund advisors would select the program manager. Um, this may well be an entity, a nonprofit entity or even a for-profit entity with some expertise in administering innovation funding. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Annie, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you all for having me and letting me be virtual. Um, I will keep this brief and can certainly answer any questions um, as we go. For context, I lead a firm that's based in Ohio and focused on innovation in government. Broadly, have been doing um, that type of work for more than 10 years and have specifically been working on innovation in the opioid epidemic since 2015. Um, and just to go into a bit further detail about the initiative discussed, um, so the, the concept is that it would be called something like Solutions for Opioid Innovation, and the mandate would be that the funds for this initiative would be sent on supporting companies and other organizations that are developing new solutions to address the opioid epidemic. And I, I think there were lots of great examples um, shared in, in the intro to this. Um, so we'll not say more there, but um, the idea is for $10 million to be allocated. Um, the group planning this envisions three years of active work um, where the parties involved, um, the mainly the program manager and the board of advisors, um, would essentially work together to take portions of that $10 million and make investments um, on an investment by investment basis based on the needs in the county um, and the interests of the board of advisors um, over three years, and then those investments would be fully realized through pilots over a five-year initiative life. Um, just going into a bit more detail about what that would look like, because this is very high level at this point. Um, you know, the, the left-hand side of this page outlines the three um, elements that the investment from the county would include. The first is obviously the financial commitment, the financial investment to support specific groups that are doing innovative work in addiction prevention and treatment. Um, the second is creating that infrastructure to support that work. So one of the challenges now um, and why we see so many great ideas kind of fail to materialize in the healthcare system is that there's often not um, the right operational or programmatic support um, to push along the combination of essentially the new idea of meeting the, the current system in a way that's actually going to make it impactful. So that um, just to build on the comments made about the program manager role is something that the program manager would really take a lead on along with the clinical partners that we imagine here. Um, and then the third piece um, that the county would bring would be a commitment to, you know, better and more equitable healthcare innovation on this topic. Um, I know, um, again, many have mentioned this in prior conversations about this and earlier in this meeting, but 
the county really has an opportunity to be a leader here. Unfortunately, this is an issue we've all been aware of um, and many people have been directly affected by for quite some time. Um, and despite that, I think there's still a huge need um, to find better ways to work on it. Um, in terms of outcomes, um, the, this model would be you know, very unique and first of its kind for a county to be leading innovation like this. And we think it would produce four very unique outcomes that would be very meaningful for impacting the county directly and also nationally for the county to lead. The first is new, new learning. So, you know, what is going to work in prevention and treatment? This is the way that um, the county will learn and be able to try new things and also be able to share that with others. Um, the second is that the model envisions a success-based repayment model to the initiative so that as solutions work, um, and have impact, there's the ability to create more sustainable um, funding, both for those initiatives themselves beyond um, the opioid funds that, that would kickstart it, and then also for that money to come back into the fund um, and be spent on, on new things um, that might work as well. The third is that um, it creates a test bed in the county for better and more equitable healthcare innovation. So, um, you know, the the in partnership here envisioned is the program manager working with local community members um, and also clinical leaders to design pilots using new innovations to figure out what works. And in order to do that, um, you know, the county is going to be able to marshal resources in healthcare leadership that already exist um, to this problem in a way that will really drive um, the creation of a test bed on this issue. Um, and then the third is the ability to focus on, um, you know, specific innovation needs that the county wants to prioritize. That would be articulated through that board of advisors and based on county needs. But a big one that has come up in our design is, you know, the ability to focus on populations that might historically have been last in line for innovative approaches to um, care, including the Medicaid populations and others that are underserved. Um, just moving forward, um, we certainly spent quite some time working with the many groups in the county that already exist with lots of expertise on this topic area. Um, there are many. Um, certainly the first is addiction care leaders, clinicians, and administrators talk to a wide range um, in that group, including from, you know, large health systems, FQHCs, and the Atomist Board, um, also spoke with the many innovation and experts that exist locally um, on healthcare innovation, entrepreneurship broadly, and early stage investing. There are a lot of people thinking about this um, that many of you, I'm sure, know and have heard from a lot. Um, the third is we talk to relevant startups and investors and kind of others who are working on innovation in this area to get a sense of um, what their needs are and how to make um, this initiative attractive and useful to them. Um, and then the third, the fourth is obviously throughout our firm's life of working on this topic um, and, and my experience working on this topic have engaged with many patients and families and others. Um, as well as frontline workforce who are critical um, to weigh in and influence and frankly lead on what the biggest issues are. And I think um, while they were engaged in this work from the standpoint of our broader knowledge of, of those needs, this would be something that would be part of the ongoing um, identification of needs and prioritization by that advisory group and the program manager. So um, much more important to actually incorporate that on a project by project or initiative initiative level. Um, and the last thing I'll just close with quickly um, is why this model is different. So, you know, I think there are many things um, that make this model unique, but um, one of the challenges on this topic specifically and, and really kind of having an actual impact on the opioid problem um, and addiction epidemic that we face is that it's been difficult for a lot of those who are innovating to get direct traction um, on the problem. So this would allow the county to enable that through use of opioid funds to facilitate bringing innovations to actual patients um, and caregivers who are working on this every day. Um, it would also allow the county um, to invest in areas that don't get funded 
um, as much by um, pure private investment. So prevention is one of those more root cause solutions when treatment fails um, is another example. And then the last thing that we've already mentioned is it would also allow the county to focus innovation on those who are historically last in line for, you know, getting access to the, the best new ways to think about something that um, is historically hard to treat. And I will just leave everyone with this. Um, as far as how the 10 million would be allocated, we envision that um, three to six large pilots of um, you know, 60 to 80% of the funding would be um, spent on that. 20 to 30% would be spent on smaller, um, more kind of um, experimental and maybe less um, assured uh, ideas. So smaller investments, um, smaller bets, we would imagine being able to use 20 to 30% of the funds for um, five to 10 smaller bets. And then five to 10% of the funds would be spent for operations. And just as a reminder, that would be for the whole life of the um, five-year period where we would imagine this um, work taking place. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, that concludes Annie's testimony today. She's open for questions. Any questions for uh, Ms. Rickens? Mr. Chairman. If, if I could, um, to um, Ms. Rickens, uh, um, is she on the screen or? I can hear you, sir. Okay, she can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, so th thank you for being here um, this afternoon. Um, so let me ask you, as far as what would, would you have a direct role in this or your, your um, company have a direct role? No, we do not envision that. So you, are, you're, you're just here to, um, to do what, to? Our role, um, our work was funded by the Cleveland Foundation to work with the county on designing this. And that's something we do all the time. We design public sector programs like this. Okay. Um, and, so I'm just here to okay. represent. And then um, as far as the, the uh, 60 to 80% you mentioned in funding, I, I didn't catch what you had said. What would that go towards? Large pilots of more mature innovations that might have some traction but need a relationship with an organization like Metro or Cleveland Clinic or UH to really figure out how to scale what they're doing to a larger population. Okay. Um, so pilots of their ideas. Okay. And then um, as far as the five to 10% in operations, what, uh, what do you mean by operations? We imagine most of this would go to the, the program manager role, which would need to be secured through an RFP, but essentially that would be the group running the pilots um, and making sure to, to some of the comments earlier mentioned, um, there are clear objectives to meet. So, you know, if we want to reach, for example, 200 mothers, um, you know, struggling with opioid, um, opioid addiction through a pilot and reduce their um, opioid dependence by some certain amount, um, you know, we would set those metrics at the outset, the, the program manager would, um, and make sure that the pilot was set up to actually run in a, you know, a period, call it six months, to determine whether the, it was able to achieve those results and then kind of report back to the fund in a way that would hold um, the pilot partners accountable. Okay. And then as far as a, a program manager, this is, you know, obviously it's a very unique um, area, opioid addiction and such and prevention. Do you believe that there would be a, a enough candidates that would be able to come forward, would be able to select you know, an appropriate candidate or is it, is it very, too limited? Do you think, you know, or are there only one or two, you know, uh, for example, in, in public works, we have, we have bridges that they'll, that go out for bidding. And in some instances, right. there's only one or two candidates because they, they're the only people who know how to do bridges a certain way. So what, what is your vision or what do you envision for a program manager? Do you think that there's a market for that or is this a very unique area? I think there's certainly a market for this and functionally this exists in a lot of organizations nationally. Okay. I think the county would need to decide through that process um, how to prioritize local presence over um, subject matter expertise. And, you know, of course, once you start filtering for a local presence or really specific subject matter expertise, the pool gets much more narrow, but there's, there's certainly quite a few groups that okay. have the capability to do this well. 
Okay, and and um, so I just want I just want to be for <laughs> straightforward on this. Um, I, Mr. Schrand, you know, had had has worked very uh, diligently on this, and and um, he's, it's a very unique idea, obviously, um, and very innovative idea. And and one of my concerns, and it does it doesn't mean it's an actual, you know, it's it's a reality. But one of my concerns is that people are going to be profiting off of other people's misery, <laughs> you know, so. That would be one thing that I just would find utterly unacceptable if there's businesses out there, you know, keeping this opioid crisis alive to, so we can continue innovating. Um, and I know that sounds really, you know, maybe extreme, but it, it's, it's a legitimate concern of mine because I've um, worked with the, the, the um, medical examiner directly on this, on prevention and just on a small little pilot program in Parma. So it's very near and dear to, to my heart here. So... Um, I just ha have to make that concern known. If I may, um, is that a question? <laughs> it's it's more of a comment, honestly. It's it's okay. just more of a comment, and I mean, you can feel free to uh, you know comment back or just disregard it. <laughs> well, I I if I may comment back, um, I shared that concern and um, have been working on this issue um, mainly through volunteer and nonprofit um, endeavors for almost seven years now. Um, and I think the reason that this model is responsive to that is um, private money it, and falls into this, the, the trap that venture capital often does, which is, you know, it can be very useful um, for supercharging activity on a problem like this, but sometimes it prioritizes things that are not necessarily um, the biggest struggles for everyday people struggling with opioid uh, um, addiction or the workforce and clinical groups trying to work on it. And so through this investment, the county would basically be able to um, support acceleration of ideas that are more public serving um, and tend to actually not make it um, as quickly to the top of the pile in a more traditional venture model. Um, so I think the county's funding here um, could play that bridge role in a way that would actually help combat that. And I, I think just, you know, everyone knows that this this problem was created by a private company. Um, in, you know, there are a lot of factors, but I, I think it's worth acknowledging to your point that um, that's always the concern. And I think the county's funds could actually help direct how private activity gets channeled in a way that could be very powerful. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank you, Ms. Ritkus, for, uh, for being with us this afternoon. And I think we have an additional question. Thank you, sir. Uh, just, just real quickly, um, you said you've been working on this for seven years. What is nationally or worldwide the institution, academic or medical, that is the leader in innovation dealing with opioid addiction? There are a couple different ways to think about that. Um, I think Cleveland, um, California Healthcare Foundation has been really good at doing something analogous to this, which is picking both private companies and nonprofit organizations that are trying new things and helping them scale practically. So from the standpoint of what's most similar to this, I think California Healthcare Foundation has actually done the most work through their opioid innovation fund. Um, I'm not sure that's what it's called, but it is, focused entirely on that. Um, it makes equity investments in, in organizations um, or yeah. grant. I'm sorry, Calgary, you said? Oh, no, sorry, California Healthcare Foundation, CHCF. Um, and who specifically is that? What, what institution are they associated with? They um, actually spun out of Anthem, I believe, many years ago when a lot of plans were required to spin out um, certain activities. And so it is a foundation based in California and they, they focus entirely on using the endowment that came from that initial Anthem spin out um, to invest in um, impact oriented things that move the needle in healthcare, typically from an operational practical standpoint. Um, so not, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, there's always innovation like happening in um, new biotech type of areas or new wearables, you know, things that we tr tend to picture when we think of innovation as the kind of a sexy topic. But California Healthcare Foundation um, is focused on scaling practical solutions um, and, yeah, happy to provide any more information so about that. that. That's a private organization? 
They're a not they're a foundation. Yes, they're foundation. They so there's no okay. academic institute or medical association. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, oh. name it, that is the leader in this where we could look at and say, gee, we're thinking about doing this. Is it a wise thing to do? I think all of those groups that you just mentioned, like every major academic medical center has an initiative focused on this by now. Um, Cleveland Clinic, UH, Metro, you know, certainly are all um, thinking about this you know, in, in various ways. Boston Medical Center is very um, far along on thinking about this. I'm happy to provide a full list. There are, there are you know, tens to hundreds of, of academic and large health system players really thinking deeply about this topic because I think they all feel it first in their EDs and um, in kind of all the ways that they see how this epidemic is affecting both patients and frontline staff. But um, I, I do think that would be a great um, group to test that with. Yes. Well, it, it just, have. it just seems to me, I'm not getting an answer to my question. There's no one place we can go to, 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 to run this by them and say, here's what we're doing. Basically, um, all these institutions obviously are dealing with this as we are in the state of Ohio and specifically in Appalachia and Cuyahoga County and, th and throughout the Akron area been hit hard, continue to get hit hard. We know where the problem is and where all this is coming from, which is China, and it's coming over our borders, Boris and not Boris. It's getting here. Uh, my concern is, is taking money that could be going to recovery services as opposed to throwing a dart in the dark at a board that nobody seems to know where it's at. That's, that's, my, that's my concern. And uh, you, you've obviously pretty much just told me there's nobody doing this in the world that we can I really... Think there, I think Go ahead. Yes. No one's doing exactly this, which is why I think the initiative is exciting. I think, you know, Metro Health would probably be the best group to ask. That's who I would ask. California Healthcare Foundation, I think, is the most analogous. So depending on kind of what you're prioritizing, those would be the two groups I would test this idea with first. And we have talked to both of them about it. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so we've completed a, a presentation on the structural aspects of the program. We now have a, a number of programmatic speakers. And to make sure that we hear from everybody, I would like to... Uh, Hear all of the remaining speakers, one right after another, and then we'll, and then you can, uh, they'll all be available, and people can direct questions to anybody that they'd like to direct them to. Thank you, Chair. And before I sit down, let the experts come up. I do want to note, at the previous hearing on this topic, a number of council members specifically said we would like to hear from Dr. Boutros. Dr. Boutros has made himself available and is the first of our expert speakers today. Thank you very much for being with us. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chairman. Just before I start, I am not, I'm going to read my statement. I am not going to be able to stay. Uh, it's beyond uh, the time that I had committed to this. So I would be happy to answer questions a little later date to have a pressing engagement. So again, thank you to the council and administration for asking me to be here today to offer my perspectives. As I noted in a letter earlier this month to Executive Budish and Council, uh, Council uh, President Jones, the need to provide uh, treatment to people in our community struggling with mental illness or, and substance use disorder has never been more urgent. Cuyahoga County is on pace to suffer a record number of overdose, overdose deaths this year, a figure double what it was in 2015. The demand for mental health support and addiction support has surged since the COVID pandemic, with soaring rates of depression, thoughts of suicide, anxiety, and other ailments across all ages, races, and genders. Many people turn to substance use to, uh, disorder to deal with these issues. I've been here before you, uh, previously stressing the need for all of us the city, the county, medical community, social services providers, treatment providers, and yes, Metro Health, 
to think creatively and collaboratively on how to address this once in a gener generation problem. Health, business, and government leaders have advanced the idea of looking to find solutions based in technology, among other approaches. And the county executive and I have talked about other potential solutions. So that's why I'm here before you today to talk about innovation initiatives that support reductions in opioid use and deaths. I want to make a few things clear up front. Metro Health would not receive a penny for the, from the contemplated legislation. This is not a Metro Health program. However, if there's a promising technology being developed through this program, Metro Health would be happy to have our patients to uh, utilize the programs. We would love the opportunity to have access to that support. Ideally, these solutions would provide for more equitable access to innovative care to all patients, irrespective of their socioeconomic status or race. These populations, as you have heard, have historically been last in line for innovative care. This could be one piece in a larger puzzle of pulling ourselves out of this struggle. The Metro Health System is proud to have opened its Behavioral Health Hospital at Cleveland Heights this month. This hospital offers 112 beds for inpatient treatments of adolescent, adult, and geriatric patients, as well as intensive outpatient care programs for behavioral health issues as well as substance use disorder. While it was not originally planned, we are now going to open a psychiatric emergency department in the Cleveland Heights Hospital, given the uncertainty about the long-term future of St. Vincent's um, Psychiatric Emergency Department. This is necessary to help keep people out of the criminal justice system, the child welfare system, and to initiate appropriate level of both behavioral health addiction care, and medical care. Our county needs meaningful planning and decisive action. Without it, the problems will mount and more patients will receive mental health and addiction care through more costly sittings, settings, such as the emergency department, in jail cells, or the child welfare system. Put bluntly, no one is coming to rescue us. It's up to the county to lead the way in addressing this problem. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd ask if, if anybody has one or two really pressing questions before uh, Dr. Boutrous has to leave. I have one. Councilman Tron. Uh, Dr. Boutrous, you're, I think, a rather innovative and creative guy. Um, I try to be. Yeah. You heard a comment about if no one's doing that, why would you want to be the first one to do something as a risk? Uh, and this fund is a first risk fund out there. And you've heard one of my colleagues say, well, if no one's doing it, you can't do this because no one else is doing it. You don't have the verification that it can be done. Uh, so your history of it being innovative in, in, in medical and, uh, and treatments and care and, and ideas and processes. Well, uh, so uh, innovation is about taking uh, risks, and certainly in this space, I would see significantly more failures than successes, because people would try different things, and and uh, and uh, some would work, some others wouldn't. But the the idea is, uh, I think, is what you're proposing is an investment in something that could work, and should it be able to work, it can significantly expand the 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 um, uh, access to, to opioid care. We are already, Metro Health is uh, discussing uh, with a, a technology company how to provide um, opioid uh, uh, medically assisted treatment over um, uh, video conferencing so that we're able to do that across the way. Now, I can't tell you that's gonna work or not, but that's one such innovation, right? The person doesn't have to leave their home to go somewhere else to get medically assisted treatment. That program works, that's gonna be really wonderful. Is that being done anyplace else other than, to your knowledge? Other oh than yeah, so, so, so there are there are about six health systems who are using it. 
And it's too early to tell you if it's successful or not. But that's the innovation that you're talking about to be to invest in, right? Somebody comes up with the idea, has the capital to start it, and then uh, 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 the fund could support that to make sure it's more equitable. So I, I will tell you is that this organization, our biggest problem with them mm -hmm. is they did not want to provide these services to Medicaid patients. They wanted to only provide it to highly insured or uh, cash pay patients. So we are working with them to say Metro Health will take some of those risks for those patients. So those patients that you keep, that people keep mentioning, that the socioeconomically challenged and Medicaid patients are, are, are the ones who get are always last in line for innovation. Thank you very much, Dr. Boutus. We really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Oh. Can I just get a copy of your written comments? Because you are, I, 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 need I, to... I, I just made some corrections, so can I retype it and send it to you? Oh, what, yeah, I just yeah, wanted actually, to. Actually, Mike will, Mike will have it for you. Okay. Just <laughs> on a point of personal privilege, too? This could be your last time as the CEO of Metro. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm coming back. You are? Yes, sir. Good. I I'll, promise. I'll I'm, coming my, back. Uh... I'm coming back for uh, the budget. I have to present it to you. One, That'll be my last privilege, just to present you the budget. I look forward <laughs> to having that opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank Perhaps you the managing much. member of uh, the Innovation Fund. Uh, we'll see. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Okay. Off the plane, I'm told. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon, Chair. Great to be with Council today. I'm just going to share a few comments uh, as someone that's been working at the intersection of public, private, philanthropic, and institutional innovative projects in uh, Cuyahoga County for 18 years. Um, first, I'd want to express my appreciation for the leadership of this Council. Uh, there's a reason why some of these uh, issues and challenges that we're talking about today are called wicked problems. This is a perfect example of a very wicked or very complex problem, not only in the context of innovation, but of course our community and our society. There's no single approach or no single solution that might work in another community that would even work here. So um, having said that, um, I also would want to share with Council how impressed I am with the process the team, county's leadership has gone through. They, we've been, we, the collective we, the community has been dialoguing about this problem for it feels like at least 18 months. Uh, so this isn't something that, uh, that staff and leadership has thought about casually. I've been incredibly impressed with Annie and her team and their experience and the iteration uh, that they have gone through to come to a set of recommendations. My final uh, comment really is I'd want council, should they decide to move forward with this, to have the confidence, perhaps to uh, Congressman Tuma's comments, that the community can collectively inform a, an optimal solution together. So I think the right solution for uh, if this fund was to go forward, would to have all of our subject matter experts in the community together envisioning how to execute an answer. I think one of the challenges that we're maybe all dealing with is how do you measure success? And uh, certainly in my, in my world, oftentimes uh, that's measured in jobs or private investment or tax receipts that are generated. And potentially uh, that could be important here too. But I think there's, there's many more important things than, than tax receipts or only jobs as it relates to the opioid challenge. Now, that doesn't mean that we couldn't get those as well, but obviously we're looking at the health and welfare uh, of our fellow residents. So um, maybe to quote Beju Shaw for the second time in an hour, the kind of the all-in culture of collaboration at the intersections of healthcare, economic development, workforce, and the health, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion of our residents is a very, very real um, asset to the community. And so I'm excited uh, to leverage uh, my personal and professional experience to not only inform or help shape the right answer for all the things that this council or this body would really be governing. Because I think the other uh, great uh, aspect to this is this will be an iterative process 
the this body will have the opportunity to see that process as it evolves and to, and to have a dialogue and feedback on you know how can this uh, initiative be a continuously improving opportunity for obviously your important dollars the last thing i will share is i do think um, Opioid addiction and these issues, calling them a wicked problem. Annie uh, made a comment earlier about oftentimes you'll have problems that are so challenging that the private sector is scared to invest in it. It's just too complex. Uh, and particularly if the private sector is looking only for a financial return. So I am confident that the county's leadership in this regard will signal uh, to the market, one, the importance of these issues and challenges, but also that there'll be other parties who will follow the county, whether they're other public entities uh, or, uh, or private entities. A simple example of a potential that I would certainly be happy to help uh, leadership, you know, the program manager, or whoever ends up dealing with this, is the state of Ohio has just recently made $180 million available uh, through the through ARPA, uh, approximately 110 million of that is focused on uh, compelling challenges related to innovation uh, and our community and technology. And these are dollars that are going to flow in the next 100 to 120 days. Uh, so if this was to move forward, I will certainly make every effort to try to leverage the dollars. Uh, which I think would, would be a great near-term outcome, but I very much encourage council to, to lead uh, in an area that maybe is a little uh, out of the box, but I think that's the whole point. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Chairman, uh, next we have a duo, John Nottingham, the co-president and board chair of Nottingham Spurk, accompanied by Jeffrey Wall, the president and co-founder of Midas Healthcare Solutions, Inc., and they do have a presentation. Thank you, uh, and I do apl applaud you for having the vision of taking this step or considering this step for this fund. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for Cuyahoga County to take a leadership role in solutions to the opioid crisis. And what we want to talk about today is to show you an example of an innovative solution to that crisis that can be commercialized in Cairo County. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, it's pretty well known that all U.S. patents you know, that have been um, issued in the United States, only 5% get commercialized. Um, you may know that Nottingham Spurk, as an innovation company, has a vertically integrated system that has created 1,400 patents, and of those 1,400 patents, 95% have been commercialized. So what I want to do is to introduce you to one of our venture innovations called Midas, and I'm going to bring up uh, Jeff Wall, who's the head of Midas, to show you this example, and I think you'll be very excited about it. Good afternoon. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Jeff Wall. I am the president and co-founder of Midas Healthcare Solutions. Uh, we have nothing to do with car parts or uh, mufflers. Midas actually is an acronym for Medication Integrity Diversion Accountability System. I'm going to shrink my 42 years of living in Cuyahoga County into one slide. So I, I'm a Cuyahoga County resident by choice. I came here in 1980 to start law school at Case Western Reserve. And 42 years later, I am now on the faculty of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. So that's what 42 years has done here. Uh, I put the, the logo of the International Health Facility Diversion Association up on this slide. I'm very, very involved with that organization, which is actually based in Cincinnati. I just came back and was keynote lecturer at their annual meeting. Think of how sad it is that there has to be an international organization to deal with drug diversion in hospitals, in healthcare institutions. And the technology I'm going to talk about, which we are building here in Cuyahoga County, is what I discussed with 500 diversion officers 
at that meeting in Nashville a couple of weeks ago. So looking at the uh, settlement funds, I realize that you know so much of what has been discussed previously has been has been treatment. And there's a huge value in that. But there's another important and impactful portion of what we think would be a, a segment of those settlement funds in the innovation fund, which is prevention. We would ask support of development of opioid safety technology here in Cuyahoga County. Well, we all know the great things that we have here, and this is why we live here, and this is why after 42 years, I stayed. The parks, the sports teams, the orchestra, other arts institutions like the Art Museum, Playhouse Square down the street, some of the best suburbs in the country, and of course, the world's best health care. That's what we have here. The problem is every time anyone talks about the opioid crisis or opioid litigation, it's always Dateline Cleveland. That's what people think of. That's where they put the push pin into the cork board. Cleveland, 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 opioids and litigation. Cuyahoga County should be known for opioid innovation, not opioid litigation. I'm going to talk about what Becton Dickinson, a $75 billion company that's in every hospital around the country, has deemed healthcare's hidden epidemic, which is diversion of medications, not the stuff coming across the border, pardon me. It's medications used in hospitals, used in surgery centers, used in ambulances, used in every healthcare institution around the country. And diversion is when healthcare providers take medications that are supposed to be given to patients, patients having surgery, patients being treated, and they take it for themselves, either to self-administer or to sell on the street. So what do you know about diversion? Diversion can be as simple as, I live next door to Mr. Schron, I pull my back out and I say, hey Jack, you got any Vicodin from my back? And he says, sure, here's a couple, I haven't left over from something before. That's drug diversion. Drug diversion is when pharmacy technologists at Embry University intercepted $40 million of drugs at the loading dock and were walking down the street in Atlanta $40 million of opioids that never made it into the building. That's diversion. Diversion is a case that I handled in federal court, and I can't tell you where, where a nurse in the intensive care unit took a patient's fentanyl, not again street fentanyl, legal prescribed fentanyl, and shot himself up with it, came back and did some unspeakably bad things to patients, including one that I represented who ultimately died from that. And that happened here in Cleveland. So drug diversion is such a big problem, it happens 4,000 or 5,000 times a day in medical centers across the country, which means four out of five hospitals in the United States have a diversion of an opioid or a controlled substance every single day. It's happening here, it's happening down the street, it's a ubiquitous problem. So we're gonna talk about medication waste, and that's where many of the diversions occur. So think about our prescription, Jack. I get 30 Vicodin, but I only use three. 27 is waste, it's what's left over. Or in a hospital, if I'm having surgery and the anesthesiologist pulls a vial of fentanyl and he only uses half of it, what isn't used can't go back into circulation or be given to another patient. So the amount taken out of the pharmacy minus the amount given to the patient is medication waste. It happens all the time in hospitals. Ketamine, fentanyl in all of its forms, again, not street fentanyl, fentanyl that we all have when we have surgery, or fentanyl patches, another way that patients with chronic pain get their fentanyl legally is with transdermal patches. They also become a diversion target. Why? You don't need to boil them, you don't need to shoot them up, you don't need a nurse to give them to you. So they are frequently diverted. Propofol, the drug that they give you when they tell you to count back and back from 100 when you have surgery or colonoscopy, the most diverted drug in the hospital. And remarkably, it's not a controlled substance. 
think Michael Jackson. That's the Michael Jackson drug. And then things like morphine pills. So it's pills, patches, injectables. There are a billion wasting occurrences every year in American hospitals. And each one is a diversion risk and a patient safety risk. Because an unwell caregiver who diverts can do bad things to us as their patients. Hospitals, surgery centers, nursing homes, ambulances, and then think about the sheriff's office, the DEA, the Justice Department, police stations. They also, I mean, prisons have um, health facilities. There's diversion in prisons, plus all the confiscated medications that are evidence. They also are frequently diverted. And this is just a, a cavalcade of really sad stories from around the country. Nurses at Yale stealing fentanyl so that women undergoing egg retrievals to try to get pregnant have surgery without anesthetic, things like that. The two faces you see on the bottom are RNs, nurses at the Univers University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. They took fentanyl out of a pharmacy dispensing machine used it themselves and died two years apart in the same bathroom in the hospital where they worked as RNs. And that's why they have a three-year relationship now with the DEA for all of the things they did improperly. More news stories, and these are just in the last couple of weeks. There was a diversion in New Hampshire where a nurse at a small hospital took seven and a half gallons Gallons, that's a liquor store of fentanyl, and nobody knew it. Why? Because she was in charge of the fentanyl. It's a huge, huge national problem. So we are creating hospital diversion prevention technology. It's software. It lives on a tablet, and it lives on a small cart, because in that cart are chemicals that will destroy the excess medication. It'll waste the waste, and it's a couple of touches on a screen. It's very simple technology. This is an earlier version of it, which was a kiosk that we developed with John and his team up the street at Nottingham Spurk. And we brought in real users, not users of drugs, users of technology, nurses, pharmacists, anesthesiologists, and they all said, we are looking for a way to make sure that when we do it right, we can prove that we do it right, and we want to prevent our colleagues from going down the rabbit hole of diversion and substance use. And you can see all kinds of endorsements. We have endorsements from the former administrator of the DEA, the head of the anesthesia groups, the head of nursing, the head of pharmacy, and patient safety groups. We anticipate pilot deployments of this technology across the country at major medical systems mid-2023. So we already have pilots lined up. In fact, after this meeting in Nashville two weeks ago when I lectured, hospital diversion teams came up to me and said, we want to test your stuff because it's the only thing that's going to prevent this. So we have lots of amazing people on our development team. We need key opinion leaders, influencers, people who understand the problem. Dr. Cosgrove joined us very early in our quest. Why? Because he said to me, when I was CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, I cannot give you the number of caregivers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, who died from diverted fentanyl and diverted medications in my hospital. This is a local problem, it's a county problem, it's a national problem. Dr. Roizen, now emeritus in the wellness department at the Cleveland Clinic, first was an anesthesiologist. And when he started as the chief of anesthesia, what did he do? He drug tested all of their anesthesia providers and training, their residents and fellows. And 25% of them tested positive for a drug that they took from the hospital. 25%, and they're taking care of us and our families. This is not to vilify anybody. This is to protect. Dr. Marla Weston ran the American Nurses Association, 4 million nurses, and they will be the primary users of our system. Dr. Andrea Barthwell, Dr. Barthwell from Chicago was President George W. Bush's ONDCP head at the White House. So she is a, a, an addiction medicine physician, very, very important to public policy on drugs, and also was president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. 
This is an example of the people we have working with us. And then, of course, our friends at Nottingham Spurk. Um, John mentioned that they have 1,300 patents, which uh, adorn their walls. You should go visit. There's 1,301. Our first anti-diversion technology received its first patent in the United States two weeks ago. So, John, you got to put another uh, bullet up on the wall. Other Cuyahoga County companies up the street on Euclid, MCPC, one of the leading data security companies is our partner. They're working with us on the tablets and the carts. Codonix out by the airport, another major Cuyahoga County company, operating room technology. They are in 75% of operating rooms around the country. It's the biggest little company you've never heard of, but we're working with them on end-to-end -end solutions. Up the street, down the street, the Center for Health Affairs. Look, it's a consortium on opioids of all of the hospitals in Cuyahoga County. They not only support what we're doing, they put their money where their mouth is. They invested their money in our technology. In fact, we were their first outside investment. And we plan to be piloting at at least one of the local hospitals in their opioid consortium. Could be UH, it could actually be the VA because last week I had a two hour conversation with the chief of staff at the VA and she said, we need to do it in Cleveland because the Cleveland VA is important to us. So this is the kind of press release that ought to be out. A Pittsburgh based company just made a $1.2 million investment in the technology I'm describing today. So Dateline Cleveland for good things, not for the opioid crisis, for solutions. We have bipartisan support in Washington. The opioid crisis is not a political issue. So in a video that was prepared for us, Senator Brown said, our work, Midas's work in our community matters so much. And Senator Portman also sent us a video that said he's glad that we're contributing to solving the pressing crisis that's facing so many communities, not just ours, and he wishes us the best of luck. So it comes from both sides. Two years ago during COVID, I had the privilege of testifying in front of Congress. They have what's now called the Bipartisan Congressional Substance Abuse and Mental Health Task Force. And they asked me to come to present this same technology because they're looking at it from a federal standpoint and they wanna get rid of the regulation and improve the innovation. And after that, and this one made my 90 year old dad pretty happy, the two chairs of the committee called me an expert on drug abuse and prevention and said that my testimony showcased our technology to prevent addiction and promote patient safety. Their words, not mine. Then let's flip back to the Jack and Jeff problem. What do we do with the medications that we hoard in our medicine cabinets? Raise your hand, who's got bottles? This is, I mean, this is on video. I've got bottles in my medicine cabinet. I assume many of you do as well. And the folks at Stericycle did a survey three years ago on this. Why do people hoard prescriptions? And it's not just opioids, it's other stuff too. It's because they're afraid. They're afraid that they might need it again. 37% of the people surveyed said, I, I'm afraid I won't be able to get it anymore, anymore. Or that the reason I got it in the first place is going to come back. I might pull my back out again, Jack, so I might need more medication. Or they don't know how or where to dispose of them. Yes, two days ago was a DEA collection site, a collection day. But isn't it remarkable, we're gonna talk about data and drug collections. The only data the DEA collects is how many pounds of pills and bottles they take back. They can't identify one single pill that somebody brings back across the country. Why? Because their own regulations don't let them. So we need to roll back the regulations. Look at the number of bottles that people have. Half the country have between one and three. Uh, the, the yellow one, if you look closely, 2% of the people in the country have seven to 10 unfinished prescription bottles in their medicine cabinets. And each of those is a diversion risk. So how many unfinished bottles are there? So we did some high level math. 400 million bottles of unfinished prescriptions sitting in our medicine cabinets, in our purses, in our kitchens in the United States. And why is this a shocking number? Because there aren't even 400 million people in the United States. There are 333 million, and I pulled this number two days ago. 
So it's rising a little bit, but not up to 400 million. So more than one for every person in the country. So you go to the FDA website and you go, okay, I got all these bottles in my cabinet. What do I do with them? This is what you get. It's a mashup. It's incomprehensible. Is there a take back day? Is it on the flush list? If it isn't on the flush list, get some kitty litter. If you don't have kitty litter, get some coffee grounds. Nobody gets it. And even if you do it right, if you can figure out this, there's no data. So let's look at two things that need data. One is library books, okay? Here we go. There's a library book drop. It's gonna look really familiar. Cuyahoga County Library is one of the technologically advanced library systems in the country. Every book has a barcode. Everything has a barcode and, and lots of different things. So I'm gonna chime in here. It's been a wonderful presentation and I've learned a lot, but we have additional speakers and the time is running late. So I'm wondering that. if you could kind of wrap it I up. I will wrap so we up. Can move, move so on. thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So the point is drug collection boxes don't collect any data. So we, what we need to do is we need to innovate. And how you do it? You take a dumb drug collection box and you give it a brain. The same technology we're using in the wasting solution we use for this. There it is. It's in development up the street at Nottingham Spurk. We can do better. So please support technology of opioid safety initiatives in this new fund here in Cuyahoga County. And as was said before, this can be a model for this type of partnership and this type of funding and development for cities and counties around the country. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, Dr. Sanctific. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to add my comments today. I'm John Sankovic, I'm the President and CEO of the Ohio Aerospace Institute. So probably the first thing you're thinking is why is someone from the Ohio Aerospace Institute coming here to talk about opioid crisis? So um, a little bit of my own background. So I've been working 35 years in the innovation space. Uh, I actually have a PhD from Case Western Reserve University in biomedical engineering. I have a graduate certificate in bioethics from uh, the Cleveland State University. I was the first uh, chief of the bioscience branch at NASA Glenn and I left as the Director of Technology Incubation and Innovation uh, and the Chief Technologist there at NASA. So I do have a little bit of background, uh, and, and my daughter's a physician. I'm a proud, proud father of a physician too, so getting your child through, through the education system into, the, into that area is uh, no small feat. Um, at OAI, what do we do? We're, we're, we work in the innovation space. We've worked for 33 years in building up teams between academia, government, and industry, and we think that's always the solution to our hard problems, is to bring those, those groups together uh, to solve that. In the end of the day, we're also employers, and those of us that have uh, had employees, the opioid crisis, addiction issues, touch all of us that hire people, and it's, it's not immune into the aerospace industry uh, as much as in, in, in the other areas. And we're part of this community, so anything we can do to help this community we stand ready to come forward. Um, we also have a couple affiliates that we work with, both uh, associated with us. The one is Great Lakes Biomimicry, which we've talked about before at Council. That activity allows us to take difficult problems and break them down into digestible pieces. But we're also very much partnered with Parallax Advanced Research, and the key there is our ability to do human machine teaming. And so a lot of times you think co-robots when you think human machine teaming, but really, at the end of the day, it's about humans being there and being overwhelmed by data. And so I know all of you are sitting there, and as I start looking at this problem, it's an overwhelming problem, and uh, Ray Leach mentioned, I think, very well when he called it a wicked problem. And so you're sitting here with people throwing all kinds of information at you, you're trying to make decisions, you get reports all the time, how do you deal with that, and how do you actually come to something actionable and to a solution? And that's what we're experts at doing, be able to take large bunches of data and be able to try and develop a path forward. I took some time to look at this uh, issue. Um, Cuyahoga County is to be commended for the work that you support here, both through the coroner's office and Case Western Reserve University of getting data. But part of the problem is the data takes too long to get out there, too long to get published, right, to get the innovation space. It could be 
two years to finally get the data together, another couple of years published in the journal, and by the time you read it, the problem has changed. And in fact, the problem has changed dr drastically. Before it was prescription opioids, we see that right there, and that's still a, a, a problem. Uh, but then that quickly morphed into heroin. Now it's quickly morphed in the latest report. Most of the deaths, and if we're looking at deaths, are a mix of cocaine with synthetic opioids, right? So that problem has shifted. In order to address the problem, you've got to be quick on the data to do that. Uh, the pandemic has also given us um, some interesting opportunities. Uh, I've looked at some recent literature published out summarizing the literature on innovations in opioid technology uh, or, or solutions. 1,925 articles were, were recently surveyed. He digested down to the latest 25. Those are the kind of issues that we need to react too fast. And one of the things that really came up is the addition of telemedicine and the advances of telemedicine. You may not know, but telemedicine actually was pioneered here in Cuyahoga County. So uh, when NASA Lewis at the time flew the Advanced Communication Technology Satellite, partnered with the Cleveland Clinic, that was one of the first telemedicine experiments that were done. Just think back if we would have capitalized on the technology where we invented it locally. And so I commend you on, on this effort. Um, there was a comment made about um, if no one else is doing it, you know, shouldn't we, shouldn't we try? And there was also a comment at SpaceX, and since I worked for NASA for 31 years, I got a comment on that one. So, and that's exactly correct. We kept doing things uh, at NASA and in, in the Defense Department and the government exactly the same way. We kept launching rockets the same way. We did not think that you could bring them back reusably. Because we were looking, if you're going to bring a rocket back, the way you bring something back is you fly it back down like a plane. And that wasn't the answer. Whenever we looked at that, you used up too much fuel, and we always gave it up. Elon Musk didn't look at it that way. He looked at it and said, I only need to have more thrust than weight right before I hit the ground. And by having someone in a different area, a different set of thinking come in, you can completely change everything. So again, my, I, my compliments to this group to, to taking a look at, at the crisis. The other thing to look at, and I haven't heard it mentioned at all, so and you may have in other hearings, is that industry point, right? So when I looked at the data, half of the deaths are occurring in the construction industry. You had another 20% of the deaths are in the food service industry. You've got more than two-thirds of the people dying in two industries. You've got to bring business to the table and start working with those industries and, and that pool right there. Uh, you've got the data, and again, it's a matter of looking at all the data and tools to look at. So again, in summary, um, I'm very supportive of this effort. These are the kind of things we need to do in order to solve a problem. You have to spend a little bit of money in a, in a tangent area and, and see what fruits can come in. Otherwise, you're going to use up all your seed corn, and at the end of the day, you're going to wind up starving and not have solved the problem. So thank you very much. And again, uh, the Ohio, and just for the record, uh, we have no business interest in this activity whatsoever. We're not planning on, on uh, getting any contracts. We've not in, been involved in any of the studies. Uh, we're here simply as, as a community partner looking to bring innovative ideas in our innovation ecosystem with, with the partners that have also testified uh, to help this community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair, we have two additional experts to present before the question period. First, um, someone who I remember very well from my time in law school in the 80s, who was then serving as the U.S. Attorney, Patrick McLaughlin, has been very active since then. He knows many of you in working on prevention. Chairman, members of council, thank Welcome you very to much. The committee. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here with you today. It's fair to say that I began thinking about the drug crisis four decades ago. In fact, 36 years ago on September the 5th of 1986, I hosted a gathering of 750 community leaders from throughout northern Ohio, the 36 counties, uh, in fact, were in attendance advocating for a call to total community action. At that time, we formed the Northern Ohio Drug Abuse Awareness and Prevention Task Force. As I opened the conference as the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio, this, this is what I said. In the long term, it's through prevention of the first use of illegal drugs and not through treatment once drugs have been used that will be successful. 36 years later, I stand by that statement. 
In my view, unfortunately, the nation has fa failed to develop and sustain effective strategies and programs to educate on the perils of illegal drug use by promoting awareness and prevention of drug use. We have failed collectively to create uh, and address the demand side of the nation's insatiable demand for illegal drugs. So America is always in a drug crisis. Only the name of the illegal substance uh, has changed over the decades. Now we focus on opioids and, and specifically fentanyl. Next year, who knows what the drug crisis will be. Point is, there will be a drug crisis no matter the name of the drug. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And this council is actually addressing that subject, and I applaud you and thank you. Um, there are three com components to the national drug problem, the supply side, the demand side, and treatment. The second and mostly overlooked component is the demand side of drugs. This focuses on education and prevention efforts designed to help stop individuals primarily children and young adults, young persons, from using drugs. Innovative efforts are required to support this prong by offering straight talk and information about the harmful consequences of drug use and importantly, as to our youth, how to recognize and avoid peer pressure. While all three components are essential, I address my remarks to the demand side. Illegal drugs and clearly fentanyl kills people. Fentanyl kills even on one use. It is poison. Fentanyl-laced drugs are killing people right now in our community. Some of those are or will be young adults. There'll be teens that haven't heard of the risk of fentanyl being added to counterfeit pills or don't comprehend that the drug pushers are, use, are lacing other drugs with fentanyl. Doesn't this require an immediate call to action by this council? It does. And the way to address this problem now is through the education awareness and prevention programs and strategies that can be implemented in the near term and not on a multi-year projection. The demand side operation by the county would complement the innovation fund proposal and most importantly, begin the saving of lives by preventing illegal drug use and abuse with all deliberate speed. Let me provide an example of real action that can, can be implemented here in partnership with others that are effectively addressing the education, awareness, and prevention aspects of the drug dilemma. Doing some quick internet research, I found this piece by the Ad Council dated October 18, 2022. And I think it's exactly what Mr. Schron was addressing and so many others here have addressed. And that is the uh, private sector's involvement uh, in helping to solve this issue. And this two weeks old, Ad Council and leadership tech companies team up on coordinated efforts to educate youth and parents on the dangers of fentanyl. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'll leave this, I'll leave this with you. Um, here are a few quotes from this piece which highlight actions that can be accomplished in Cuyahoga County. The Ed Council, quote, launched part one of a holistic approach to tackle the overdose crisis, educating young Americans about the dangers and prevalence of fentanyl. The first phase of the campaign is funded by leading technology companies, SNAP, and YouTube with a separate campaign in partnership with Meta that focuses on informing parents of the drug dangers launched this fall. So right now, this program is being launched in the process of being launched. The campaign, uh, the piece continues, Real Deal on Fentanyl looks to educate young Americans on the dangers of fentanyl and the likelihood of it being in counterfeit prescription pills and illicit drugs. The article describes examples of multi-channel efforts to reach young adults across the country, getting them the, quote, facts on fentanyl 
through an interactive yet unconventional program in hopes that intercepting them during this impressionable time will potentially save their lives. The creative campaign la launching this fall focuses on, quote, informing parents and caregivers about the dangers of fentanyl. The new work centers on education and honest conversations, ensuring families are prepared to create open, candid, and meaningful dialogue. Important things are happening on the demand side, and Cuyahoga County must be involved. Through the leadership of council, immediate funds can be directed towards the Cuyahoga County Drug Abuse Education and Prevention Operation that adds now, that acts now and further promotes the development of new innovative ideas, creating new partnerships that save lives. So while the, the Innovation Fund uh, seeks to develop in a longer term environment uh, programs which will sustain uh, what you all hope to accomplish in the years to come. That's critically important. I support it. Uh, hopefully this council might think about carving out some other funds from the opioid litigation directed more immediately in the shorter term to this um, education, awareness, and prevention of drugs, drugs particularly fentanyl, which are killing citizens in this community today. So, again, it's, it's part of the greater innovation effort along with the private sector. Uh, and this article that I can pull up, and there are others out there, Mr. Chairman and members of council, that uh, you have people, I'm sure, that are much more adept at finding these things than I am, um, that will be able to find uh, out that there are good ideas right now circulating, you can take those ideas, begin implementing them here uh, with uh, hopefully an introduction of resources um, into uh, what is uh, and remains today, 40 years after I began thinking about it, a drug crisis in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, um, the final speaker we've arranged is Mr. Michael Gibbons. The founder and managing director of Brown, Gibbons, Lang and Company. Mike. I, I'm an investment banker and I'm not here uh, as an expert in biochemistry. Um, but uh, I, um, over the many years, have um, had people come to me that I knew and, and old friends and whatnot and say, hey, Mike, will you... Uh, you fund a startup of this or that, and I've done a number of those over the years. And probably 20 years ago, I uh, had somebody come to me, old relationship from high school. He had a cousin. He wanted to start a healthcare, uh, home healthcare business. And I said, oh, sure, I'll be glad to do that. And it was pretty successful. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to it. And I pretty busy with some other things, and uh, and generally we pick some good people and there, we pick some bad people. Yeah, so I've had uh, mixed success. Uh, I would say, thank God I have an investment banking business because I couldn't have lived on what we've done on the outside, but this has nothing to do with, uh, with Brown Gibbons Lang. Um, and in fact, uh, what I'm about to tell you about, uh, my partners, we have a significant healthcare practice in our firm out of our Chicago office. And they all told me unanimously to stay away from it, but I did it anyhow. Uh, so I hired a woman to run uh, the home health care business, and she said, I'm going to fix this for you, which she did. And when, you, when, you, when I fix it, uh, I would like you to fund the startup of, a, of an addiction uh, clinic. And that addiction clinic would use a new and innovative con uh, concept in treating opioid addiction. So I guess I'm here in support of the idea that innovation can make inroads into this, uh, but it's a tough battle you're going to end up fighting. And I think with Cuyahoga County behind it, you might have a chance of succeeding. Uh, we, uh, we started a clinic that used a, uh, a concept that the woman that came to me had discovered in Springfield, Louisiana. There was a doctor in Springfield, Louisiana that would treat about 15 patients at a time. 
uh, using something that uh, was, I'm, I'm not sure familiar, or I'm not sure whether you know, understand the word uh, uh, generally recognized as safe, or the concept of generally recognized safe, but using a, um, a coenzyme that is generally regarded as safe. So uh, you could use this enzyme without any kind of uh, risk to the patient. And indeed, uh, we began treating patients with, with a coenzyme called NAD+. And we would do intravenous feedings uh, of, this, uh, of this coenzyme. And, uh, and you're all going to say, oh, Mike, you're out of your mind. But we achieved success rates with eliminating the cravings of opioid addicts north of 75% of the patients. And uh, I know that not just because I have detailed uh, records of, of their stint at the, uh, at the clinic, uh, but I also had innumerable uh, numbers of these people come up to me and just say, you saved my life. Now, you would think this would be something that everybody would jump on board and say, boy, this is great. But what you will find, and you're going to face this, is that the medical community is n not going to believe you. Now, we had a number of largely alternative medicine doctors that were sold on this. Uh, and in fact, the Cleveland Clinic wanted nothing to do with it. But um, we ended up treating a lot of the Cleveland Clinic nurses and, and other professionals that were addicted. Uh, we treated probably less than 200 patients. And the failure of this was largely because of the business model. The woman that ran this was profit motivated. And, uh, and I have to tell you, uh, I never expected to make a profit on this, but I thought as I watched a number of my friends uh, have children that died from overdoses, and this was you know long before fentanyl was a word everybody knew, uh, this has been going on for many years. And these were largely uh, opioid-addicted patients that were uh, on uh, heroin, typically. But we also treated, and the typical process now for treatment is uh, they'll put them on a thing called Suboxone. We were treating Suboxone addicts because it's also an addictive drug that they replace heroin with. Uh, and, and these people had, you know, they were now getting a prescription for their addictive drug, uh, but that was so supposedly success. We didn't consider that success. We, we felt success was the elimination of cravings. Now, there were some reoccurrences over a period of time, uh, and another treatment with this NAD plus would, uh, again, give them a period of time when, when they had no cravings. Um, this, the whole, all the data... And, and, and I shut down the company. Uh, as I said, I had a bad business model. My, uh, the woman that ran it uh, went to an extreme. We had an office in, or a facility in, Ch in Chagrin Falls. We had a couple of chefs there, and we were providing them with gourmet meals. And uh, the numbers didn't work. And I spent a considerable amount of money on this until it became apparent uh, that we were going nowhere. We just could not draw the patients. We couldn't draw the patients because it wasn't FDA approved. So we turned to the idea that we would get uh, it FDA approved. Problem is, NAD plus is in the public domain. It's now you needed laboratory grade uh, NAD plus, which we got from Japan. But when something is inexpensive, even if it works and it can't be patented, nobody really seems interested in it. And uh, when, when Jack asked me to talk about this, I thought this was a, a perfect example of what something with the kind of uh, backing that Cuyahoga County could take to the next level if they wanted it. Uh, I would be happy to, I have no profit motivation here whatsoever. I would just like to see some opioid addicts stop using drugs. Um, but I think why I'm here is, is to make you realize that there are innovations out there uh, and that this concept is not a crazy concept. Um, and I might add that if, uh, if you wanted, I would be happy to turn over all the records and uh, try to point you in direction of people that could run this. Um, we ran into a problem. There was uh, 
un discomfort in the intravenous feeding of this uh, of this NAD plus, a little bit of chest pressure, and we added an aspirin to the solution. And in so doing, uh, we went to the FDA with this aspirin, which, by the way, is also on the generally regarded as safe list, as you might imagine. Uh, but the combination of two generally regarded as safe uh, drugs and coenzyme uh, forced us to go through toxicity tests, which added an additional $3 million to the, uh, uh, to the process of, through phase one. And uh, at that point, I had been distracted with something else, and uh, and I and it just kind of fell away, and and uh, we shut the clinic down. Um, but as I can say, we had great success, and innovation can work, and uh, you can start with this if you want to uh, if you want to put some something behind something that you, I actually know works. But I will tell you, generally, every doctor you talk to uh, that is uh, in, in the business uh, will tell you, oh, it can't possibly work. Well, I've, I've got hundreds and m many hundreds of pages of records that show you it will. Um, I think that, uh, that because of the fact that you aren't going to make a lot of money on this by selling NAD Plus and you're just providing it, you're going to get a limited amount of interest, uh, but the results are all that matter. So I... Uh, I hope I've added to uh, to support for uh, for Jack's concept here because I think that you're headed in the right direction. Uh, you just need to get the right people and the right business models in place. And unfortunately, uh, in healthcare, somebody's making money on the sale of Suboxone, and uh, somebody's always making a buck, or they won't do it. And uh, and I think m maybe something like Cuyahoga County that's not interested in a profit. Uh, may be able to take advantage of this. So, thank you very much. Here, if you could turn on your microphone, please. Several interesting presentations, and I saw Councilman Sweeney first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, followed by Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Paul, if you want to come up, I think. I just want to begin by stating that this is something long overdue. And my reflection is in the 60s and 70s, we had the psychedelic go ask Alice stuff. 80s and 90s, we had the crack cocaine epidemic. And now the 20 to 20, 20 is, but now we're going to 21, 22, 23, and we're really not trying to solve this one. So I want to give credit to Jack and his drive our county executive, this is legacy stuff if we pull it off. And I can't forget Brandy because she's been dealing with this from the get-go. And here's $110 million. Go figure out how you want to spend it. And I applaud her. Uh, the question that I have is the advisory board. we just been through an advisory board uh, reality. Who's on the advisory board? What authority will they have? What direction will they give? Because... Uh, unless it's defined very specifically, you can run into some uh, obstacles through the chair to our director. Thank you, Councilman. Um, let me say I can speak to the intent. I could also say that um, with advancing this appropriation, we will have the opportunity to bring forward the contract. The contract with the Cleveland Foundation will be where these details live, and that contract will come for another full hearing before the appropriate committee of council where we can go into more detail and if necessary make adjustments. The intent of the advisory board is to have experts, experts from a range of disciplines, um, innovation, health care, drug abuse prevention that will help together make the right decision about where the resources should be allocated. If there's um, minefields there from experience, Again, as we bring forward the contract, we can certainly invite your your um, recommendations as to something that should be written in to head off any problems or minefields. Thank you, Director. And through the chair, so you're saying when you come back, I just want this thing buttoned up so tightly that the council agrees with that this is the advisory, this is what their roles are, this is who's going to be on it, and they're going to perform and 
project that they're going to do wonderful things in making this successful. I take on this particular one laser focused topic. Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Okay, we have Ms. Baker followed by Stevens. Thank you. Um, wow, that was quite a series of presentations. Um, I guess the, the most overwhelming presenter was the drug diversion where we have our hospitals who are in a controlled area and regulated and we have a problem within that in controlled environment where drugs are misused, not accounted for, missing. How can that even be possible? Um, I, I would think that that, without any innovation technology, can be overcome just because that's illegal. I mean, what, what are we doing here? We're trying to solve a problem within our medical industry of our hospitals and our doctors that are uh, letting loose um, actions take place. I mean, I, I don't, that's one place I don't really understand that at all. Uh, there has been some efforts where physicians at one time were over giving medications, and that's been changed through state law that only so much of a controlled sub substance can be given to a person at a time, and if they want more, they have to come back and get more. So there have been efforts. The ORS system where doctors are supposed to check to make sure that they know what people are on and that they're not hopping from doctor to doctor to get more medication. That has also been an effort to can try and control it. But to think that our medical industries, our hospitals and uh, institutions are so loose that we have medications that are just uh, out there and accessible and taken by employees of a hospital, to me, seems like that needs a real deep dive. Um, I can't imagine that we're at a place where we have to have inventive ideas to stop that. That should be stopped because it's illegal. We can't be doing that within our own environment. Um, to the communication piece, um, you know, I remember when we pour money into smoking. Smoking is legal, but you smoke, the chances of you dying or getting cancer are pretty high. And so trying to get to our young people to make sure that they know this has been an ongoing effort. And you still see young people smoking. You just want to take them and shake them and wonder what in the world, how much more do they need to know? Does anybody not know that smoking can lead to cancer? Uh, you know, I, I certainly support more communication if that's what's needed for our young people to understand that drugs are the same way, that you can die from drugs, you can be addicted to drugs, it can change your life. Um, I can't see where that can hurt, but still, um, it's, it's not a message that has gone without being said. I'm not sure if you ask the average person, do you think it's a good idea to take an illegal drug? They'd probably tell you no, it's not a good idea. Um, so, you know, there are things there. I, I, I like the uh, most innovative piece where there was actually um, some proof to show that something that was not FAD, F, FDA supported but was actually showing results. I'd like to see a deeper dive in that. Um, that type or others like that, I think, are where we are more innovative than perhaps the other two that were presented. Um, but, you know, I, I just... I just can't believe that we're as loose as we are in environments that are supposed to be controlled and regulated, that we need to have an innovation fund to stop that. And to me, that's um, not where I think the dollars should be spent. They should be spent on enforcement of what's already in place, of what's not allowed to happen. Um, those are my comments from what I heard today. Thank you. Ms. Stevens. Um, I... <laughs> I tend to be very pedestrian in my approach to life. So naturally, uh, the fact that Nottingham Spurk has a product that actually asks you to do something specific and you do something specific and you take, um, reduce the amount of illegal drugs that could get out into the system is a solution to a portion of the problem. And that I understand. Uh, but I don't understand why we want to fund a big something 
which we don't understand what it is. So we were asking, we're being asked to provide $10 million with no idea what kind of programming could come out of it. You're, we're saying it might be something like what uh, um, um, Nottingham Spurk has produced or something similar to what, was it Gibbs had produced, but we have no idea. Um, I need better ideas um, before I give more, before I recommend more than a million dollars to something. Ten seems very large to me. Um, in addition, nowhere during this process did I hear anyone talking to people who actually are profilers, are, are part of the, the profile of the folks that we actually see losing their lives on a regular basis. Uh, and so that is one of my concerns that take taking into consideration during the design of some of these programs, um, because who um, Nottingham Spurk is addressing, they're professionals who have access to actual medicine in a legal way. And they, as my colleague, Ms. Baker said, they've chosen to do something they know is wrong, um, but there still needs to be a solution. And so sometimes a slap on the hand is not enough. It is immediately taking the um, drugs and putting them in a place that destroys their ability to be delivered. And so we take it, we literally reduce the human option to do something wrong um, almost immediately after the drug, 50% of a, a drug is dispersed and you can't, there's no other use for it. You destroy it immediately. I like that. Um, but we're being asked to give 10 million, not 1 million. And why is that? Do you know, Mr. Chair? Uh, I believe that we're being asked to give 10 million because it still represents only something like seven or eight percent of the innovation fund and, and, uh, and, and or, or of the uh, opiate settlement fund. And uh, we have spent uh, tens of millions of dollars and we've provided uh, very, very important and meaningful services. But the number of opiate fatalities in Cuyahoga County is, is still at record levels. And, and, uh, and, and when uh, what you're doing is not working, I think you have to try to come up with some, some new ideas to try to move the needle. And, so and we're in agreement on that? I just, I'm concerned about how much we spend. It's got to be enough to try to move the needle. I, I don't think... Uh, Who's partnering with us? What's the total project cost of the investment? Of th This is a thinking it through process. And so who else is putting money on the table? Is it just us? The, Mr. Chairman, to the council member, um, the intent is that our large investment be significant enough that it be able to support um, activity that is significant enough that attracts additional investment. As Councilman Schrond has said, both privately and publicly, it is our intent and hope to seed a fund that will grow in size beyond our initial investment. We cannot guarantee that, but we believe that by choosing innovative technologies, innovative approaches, there will be success that will um, not only help our own residents, but also demonstrate the value of technologies and attract these additional follow-on funding. And I would propose, Mr. Chairman, that we seed it in such a way that as we find more money, we put more money in it. So we put a million dollars on the table today, and if the team of folks working on this find three to five million dollars, then we up our ante and put more in the table once we find other partners not before them, but after them, with the acknowledgement that we'll start the pool, but when we get more money, then we put more money on the table. But I wanna start this, my recommendation is that we start it in a smaller way and then go up to the 10 million a little bit at a time. So we have 
Councilman Schwan and Councilman Gallagher and then Executive Butish has requested to speak to us as well. Uh, just to my, my colleague's point, you have been around in, uh, in building investments and, uh, and you know that if you do not have enough of an impact with that amount, you will not attract the other funds. That's what my belief is. We, have, we will have spent over $110 million of the settlement money shortly in the next couple of years. Okay. We will have spent $110 million. We'll have nothing to show for it. My colleague, um, Mr. Tuma, said, I'm afraid that this is going to attract people to spend money, and they will be doing that to chase dollars. All I ask is that you look at the Adams Board. Look at how much we have changed in funding just in the 12 years that we've been on council and look at the tens of millions of millions of dollars every year that we have bumped that and increased that to take care of this exact problem. So if you talk about a group that is actually continually growing, it is the treatment dollars that are growing over this. And as a result, it's getting completely out of hand. And you asked what are the projects? We, we only brought two projects in here because it was just to, to give a visual. There is no way in the world that we could walk in here with all the potential ideas and concepts. It was to bring two ideas uh, to share because last time no one said, there, are there any real ideas? And the answer, of course, is there are. They're waiting out there. And if $10 million comes in to the seed money, do I truly believe that other monies will follow? I truly believe. And it's going to be sitting over at the Cleveland Foundation. So it's not like it's, it's going to a... Uh, and, and we could probably write the clause that says if, if, uh, if it doesn't grow, it can come back from the Cleveland Foundation. Uh, I've got, anybody's got a family foundation knows that those, those kind of things can be done. But we heard from Jeff as just one example, but he wasn't just listing one company. He listed four companies that are all supporting that one company with the hard goods, with the soft goods, with, with the software, with the coding. He, he went and proceeded to show all the other companies that were directly linked to that one investment. Mr. Uh, Shran, if you could speak louder into the microphone. That would be investing in that one. So are we doing, are we asking to do something different? <clears throat> yes, uh, there's no, no question that this is, is something different, but are we getting any closer with spending the $110 million on treatment than where we are today? I don't think so. Um, I know my colleague, um, Ms. Baker was asking about, she's shocked that the fact that these drugs uh, are not traceable. I was with a doctor from the um, emergency room. I had no idea that when they take the IV bottle out, put it in the arm of the individual, those are not even logged against the individual patient. Shocking as that might be, when that fentanyl goes out there because it gets logged in, and guess what? The people who are hooked on this realize that and they go forum shopping just for the IV bottles so they can go. I'd be willing to bet that probably no one up here, I didn't know this until Saturday to the emergency room doctor said that there's not the traceability, even that, that, that we're hearing about on the pill, there's absolutely no traceability because that IV bottle is allocated against the institution. It's not allocated against the individual. And I was, I was floored that these problems exist, and can they be fixed? I don't know. Can they be fixed through, through, through investment? I believe so. But I really think, as we heard from John, when NASA said, nah, you gotta, you gotta land this aircraft this way because that was what was in their mind until private industry said, no, you list it this way and you can reuse it at one-tenth the cost. I don't know how many other one-tenth the costs are out there. But if you can imagine if our $10 million can be multiplied tenfold, what that multiplier effect would be. So uh, I do have a passion for this. I have a passion for individuals uh, that uh, I, I, my heart goes out to the individual because I really truly believe that we can get a multiplier effect uh, to private industry just the same way that SpaceX found it. Thank you. Councilman Gallagher followed by the executive. Thank you, Mr. Miller, um, 
I love thinking outside the box, and I appreciate everybody here with their stories. Um, but the one thing I haven't heard, I kept, I keep hearing about shoulda, coulda, wouldas, we're gonna, 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 and no, nobody shows up. I would have expected that private industry would have come in here with $10 million saying, well, would you please match it and we can move forward. I'm not so certain that's going to happen. It might happen, but again, we're throwing darts in the dark at a board that nobody knows where it's at. Uh, no mention of recovery services. And I don't know anybody else in here, but I only speak of myself. I'm a product of recovery. Not a shoulda, coulda, woulda. Probably wouldn't be here if I didn't have sources to go to. And we're not talking about more funding for them. I've asked some questions from some people that provide those services. When I mention what we're talking about today, they're not happy. So is it worth a putting $10 million out there for 150 more beds in Cuyahoga County with the potential to save lives immediately? Or should we do the shoulda, coulda, woulda with $10 million with a come what may, maybe $10 million following or whatnot? I, 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 I've just got a problem with this. I've just got a problem with this. I've lived it. I've survived it, and I don't see where this is going to happen tomorrow. But I know if we had more beds and more money in recovery services, I know it can work. I don't know that this is going to work. I wouldn't want to kill this potential to do this, so I might lend my support to Ms. Stevens' thoughts that maybe we float the idea that we, we put less money in with the understanding that we're not going to move forward until we get matching funds from the private sector. We represent the taxpayers of Cuyahoga County. I think that's a fair request from the private sector to come with us hand in hand as opposed to us taking a leap of faith with finite dollars for services and, and th that I know that, that could work with the potential of, of innovation working down the road. Uh, I think it's a little bit unfair of me to, to uh, step on Jack's toes like that, um, but as passionate as he is, I could tell you I'm a little bit more passionate because I'm alive today. And I've had family, I've had friends die of opioid overdoses. Um, these are not addicts. Mostly kids that are taking a pill, thinking it's Adderall. That's, that's the new crisis now. It's not the opioid addicted, it's the kids and the young adults that are taking these pills that they're getting over the internet. Um, it's a massive problem. And my heart goes out to everybody that, that has to deal with this. But to take this leap of faith with these kind of dollars, tax, well, even though they're found tax dollars, it's up to us to produce for the taxpayers some viable reason to go forward. I don't see it unless we have partners going with us. So I would... Uh, respectfully request that my colleagues think of that and consider the fact that I speak from personal knowledge and uh, I've got a uh, great appreciation for everyone that goes through this. Thank you. Executive Butish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for uh, participating in this conversation. And I especially want to thank Councilman Tron for uh, helping lead this effort. Um, this is not something we've rushed into. Uh, this is typical government. I think 
Jack and I had our first conversation about this maybe two years ago um, uh, and have been working on it uh, since. Uh, I spoke to uh, uh, Jobs Ohio. Uh, they were the ones that referred us to uh, Annie Ritgers, who you heard. Uh, they highly recommended her and indicated she would be a good person to help put this together, which she has been. Um, and Cleveland Foundation funded her activity, so it's not like we've been totally on our own. Um, I did want to respond to, I was, I was uh, reluctant to have people come in and talk about specific examples because I knew that you know, the focus could be on that, and that's not where we are. We are not the experts. In the administration, we're not the experts. The council is not the experts. That's why we want to have an expert panel to make the selections. That's why we haven't jumped on any uh, particular one or two uh, uh, items that have been brought to us already. Um, I spoke uh, uh, back when Toby Cosgrove was still the head of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and I asked him, is this a good or a bad idea? Are there things in technology that could help solve this problem? And I described, just as Jack has done to you, uh, that you know, we're investing you know, close to $100 million in treatment uh, and uh, uh, you know, ongoing efforts uh, to help people. And he said, yes, it makes a lot of sense to invest in technology to try to solve the problem so that you don't have this ongoing year after year after year, long after the funds from your settlement have disappeared. Uh, and I, I've used this example with some of you before, but this was the example he gave me. Uh, I said, what could possibly this be used for? And he said, well, there's all kinds of innovations. For example, we're looking right now at goggles, virtual reality goggles technology that could take the place of uh, uh, opioids that could be used for pain management, which is how a lot of these folks get started on uh, the uh, uh, addictive opioids. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's an example of how you can prevent people from getting addicted. Um, and over the course of the two years that Jack and I have been working on this, uh, there have been numerous excuse me, numerous examples. As Jack said, this is just two examples of what could potentially be done. And uh, to respond to uh, Councilman Gallagher, uh, one of the examples that have been brought to us uh, is processes, not even actual technological items, but uh, uh, I spoke at some length with, um, I don't know what his, uh, uh, if he's a psychiatrist, psychologist, but he has a process that he's developed to work with people. I think it involves hypnosis and some other parts to help people, again, avoid uh, getting hooked on the pain medications, pain control without using addictive medicines. So it could be a whole lot of things that this could lead, lead to. I appreciate Councilwoman uh, uh, Stephen's suggestion. I will tell you that, and if you want to bring... Uh, 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 you know, our, our friends over at, you know, Ray Leach and our friends at Jumpstart, they do, do these funds all the time. Uh, $1 million is insufficient, in my view. It won't attract anything. Um, $10 million is low. Jack and I started talking about $20 million initially, but we took it down in order to make it more palatable for the council. Um, but, uh, you know, $10 million is, a, I think, a a very basic amount based on what we've been told by people like uh, Ray and, and uh, John and others that do these investments that you really need enough to make a difference to start. And 10 million is sort of at the bottom of that list. Uh, it's not, I'm not saying that because I have no personal knowledge of that. I'm just borrowing from what we've been told. So I, I just wanted to come up and say thank you to all of you I hope you will uh, give a serious thought to this uh, proposal because uh, we have to do something. Jack has put it to best. He said, we've been the center of the opioid crisis. We should now be the center of the opioid solution. And the solution is not just continuing to treat people. That's critical. We're putting $100 million into that. But 
to put $10 million into trying to come up with an answer so that we don't have to keep putting hundreds of millions of more dollars into beds and treatment is, I think, a very wise approach. So thank you all. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Executive and uh, my colleagues. We've had uh, a long and, and thorough discussion, and I would just like to remind everybody that uh, that passing this resolution today doesn't make anything happen. All it does is that it appropriates $10 million out of the Opioid Innovation Fund, which is the first step so that the administration can come back to us with a proposed contract, which would be considered as an entirely separate piece of legislation. And, uh, and we can thoroughly consider all the different options about how it might be passed as, as is or, or tweaked in, in, in this way or that. And uh, I do believe that we have to take uh, strong action to try to do more than what we've done. And I believe that the administration deserves the opportunity to put together this contract and, and, and bring it for us before a full hearing. So, uh, so I would like to make a motion to uh, refer Resolution 2022-0342 to the full council for second reading suspension and to ask if I have a second. Second. Is there any further discussion before we vote on the issue? Um, Chair, I too um, am there with thinking that an innovation technology is a way for us to try and get in front of it. Um, but I also still have concerns. I'm not sure we're ready in this committee to move it out. I don't think we've heard from enough. I think there are other questions out there that need to be answered, even when we talk about financially, how much money should be spent, and what is innovation? I mean, from what I heard about the hospitals, to me, that's not innovation, that's enforcement. Um, that, that would not qualify, in my opinion. And communication, that's not innovative, that's something that should be done. Maybe we need to put funding into that because it is something that's probably a very good thing to do, but I'm not sure that's innovative. So I would like to see more discussion about what does innovative mean. I think we've only had one, actually, one speaker come before us that tried something that perhaps has promise but couldn't get it off the ground because of funding and FDA approval and things that were outside the ability of, of what they tried to do. But I don't know. I'm just not sure we're at a place right now that we should be moving this to full council. Mr. Chairman, Councilman oh, Tron. No, I'll let, I'll, I'll, yeah, the uh, the definition of innovation, in my mind, is to do something different than what you currently are doing, and it doesn't. Don't let your own definition of innovation constrain what could be done. It could be how we process it, as, uh, uh, as Mr. Gallagher was asking about. It could be how we actually do the interdiction of it, perhaps even at the drug border. It could be how we interdict it. So when you think of it, if we stop one pill, one pill, one person, one life, is that worth $10 million? To me, if we stop one person, the answer to me is yes. If we have the effect of hundreds of people, it becomes yes, yes, yes. And so when, whenever you're in an innovative process, I mean, uh, the, the classic D Disney innovation where they came up with the electric band to walk into the parks, where somebody said, can we eliminate the tickets? And their innovation said, let's think about putting G GPS tracking on the individual. And sure enough, what we found out is that be that became the way you enter in the park, you bought your tickets, you bought your food, you bought everything in regards to it. And so don't let one innovative thought be what constrains going forward, because I don't think there is a definition of innovation. 
Uh, Councilman Toomey. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate that, Mr. Schron. I, I, I tend to um, side with my um, colleague, uh, Ms. Baker, on this. I, I just, I, I want to make sure that we get this right because this is such an important issue, and I just think there's still a lot of questions um, from from uh, council members in the committee here. And um, I mean, I don't know that it would be um, wrong to possibly have have follow up conversation on, on this. Um, I, again, I, I just there are a lot of stuff was thrown at us uh, this afternoon, and and taking trying to take some of it in, and I don't want to short change. The idea, because it, it it it's as you said, Mr. Sean, it's very innovative, it's very forward thinking, and it would be very unique um, uh, for for this to take place in in the, the county, let alone the uh, you know country. Um, but uh, I, I just want to make sure that we do this right, and I just think there are a lot of questions here, and I, I just don't feel comfortable moving forward um, at this point. So I would. Uh bring to my colleagues' attention that that, uh, that this isn't the first time that we've heard this. We, we've had uh, we've had we've had at least one previous discussion in which it was uh, suspended for months and, and, and further worked on and and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we've also had uh, Conceptual presentations before there was even legislation, and, and uh, we've we've discussed it for over two hours, which is uh, longer than we we usually hear a piece of legislation. You know, you could always ask more questions, and you could always bring in more people. But but I would ask my colleagues. Uh, what would we really know before going forward? I, 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 you, you know, whenever you make a decision, you don't always have every possible piece of information that you could ever want. You get to a point where, where you've given it a lot of consideration and you have enough information to make a decision. So. Uh, what more do we need? You're looking I, I, would, I, I would need uh, private sector $10 million to match our $10 million, and I'd be 100% on board. I, I would need more uh, in the way of statistics, um, so, something indicating that you know, Mr. Schron indicated, talked about the Adams Board. You know, I mean, the Adams Board, if, if we need to, we can always go to them and get information and statistics. I would need something that would be able to track our success. Um, so I think that's an important element that's missing at this point. Councilman Sorry, but do you mean the, the, the success within the Adams Board? Because what we've done is we continually put, to, similar to Mr. Gallagher, we've added more beds and more beds and more beds. And the opiate... And the fentanyl problem is not getting any better. Well, I, I suppose if we're if we're going to throw additional money at, at the issue, to out, outside of Cuyahoga County, I mean there there needs to be uh, accountability as well. And I, I'm not exactly sure how we would we would judge you know success other than the rates going down. No, I think that as uh, I think as it was suggested. You would have a panel of some of the best experts. I mean, you you already had probably one of the top medical experts in the entire country come and testify to you today. And so, you asked for that. He he came in and spoke highly of the idea behind it and the idea of innovation and and how that is part of the DNA within every hospital system. Right, okay. and, and and perhaps if I, you know, perhaps if we have a little more concrete example of who who is on the, on the panel and and who we're working with, I mean, a Dr. Butrus, I feel very comfortable with. I don't know that he would even be involved in a in a final product here, you know. And and I I, I guess I'm looking for, I mean, I I know you're asking us to put a little faith into the, into what we're you know voting on, but I just would like a little bit more. You know, concreteness in in 
in the plan. I just I just think these are very general ideas, very sure. general concepts. Maybe maybe there was maybe too much was presented today. I don't, I don't know. Um, you know the the discussion about the diversion and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of that seems like there should be in some internal controls in some of these medical facilities. And I don't know that that's our our you know job to do that. That's that seems like these are some private industries that need to take more responsibility within their own industry. Um, maybe that's something that's good that came out of this discussion today. Ms. Baker. Um, you know, I guess the model of this that's been presented where 60 to 80 percent of the funding is for mature investments, to me that um, tells me that those are safe, probably things we may already be doing, and uh, goes more for perhaps what uh, the Adams Board is already working on. Ironically, the 20 to 30 percent of the funding for more experimental investments, I would perhaps like to see a smaller investment, not the 10 million, but a smaller investment that is geared more towards experimental investments so that we can certainly look at what is likely focused on prevention and is different and has never been done before. Those are the, that is what excites me about this proposal is that it is something that we are looking at as being a solution to something that we can't get our arms around. Um, that's why I say I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're ready to move forward with the conversation that we've had, but um, the funding for actual innovative, never been done, let's test it in a small pilot program seems more exciting to me than the 60 to 80 percent of funding for mature investments that we probably would have done anyway um, or, or are already being done or, or can be done within the, to within the structure that we're in. So that's, that's an opinion there that... Uh, just, just to um, Mr. Tuma's request as to who all is on, uh, on the future committee that hasn't been done, we have created bodies many times through this council. Uh, if you look through our history in the last uh, 12 years. And we don't know the names of those individuals. You just have the assurance that if they're coming forward, they're going to be professionals within that sphere or that expertise. And we have heard that the intent is to bring forth professionals, community members, medical people, uh, and you're going to have a chance to review those. You're going to you're going to review them up and down as to whether they do. And so we've done this on, on many panels, and I don't know this is any different you can't ask for the name today without even having uh, a body having been created. You can ask only the style of individual that we're going to be bringing forth. And Mr. Herdick sa said he's going to present those names. He's going to present the panel. He's going to present the entire operational agreement. And I guess uh, we've, we're, we're to the point where we're, we're, we're creating something new. It's creating something I different. different. It's changing the, the modus from where we've been and Mr. Gallagher, I am convinced uh, that there will be follow-on money from private sector. Your money has to go. The money has to, the seed money always goes in first. If you've ever been involved with investment banking, anything of that nature, and the follow-on money comes after that, uh, I am convinced that the follow-on money will be there. Uh, so, executive, can I have a quick sidebar yeah. with Councilman? Yes. We'll stand in recess for a moment.
Finance and Budget and Committee will please come back to order. I would like to recognize Councilman Tron. Mr. Chairman, uh, having heard from members of our, our committee uh, and the desire to get uh, to do something creative and be do doing something different, uh, I would uh, uh, amend my uh, the uh, an offer an amendment offer an amendment that we reduce the amount, and cut it in half from ten million to five million dollars, uh, but with the belief that that five million dollars will actually satisfy and do something that Mr. Gallagher is looking for, which will bring in money. But I'd also like to also uh, ask my committee or council members that when that matching funds come in, that we actually bump it to the other 10 so we can get another round of matching because that's the way it works with investing. You have to have an investment encouragement out there. So I would move to, uh, to move the amount uh, from, from 10 million to $5 million for the Opiate Innovation Fund to Mr. see Chairman, money. Mr. Chairman, that, that's, a, that's a reasonable request and it covers my thoughts. Um, and, and puts the onus not just on the taxpayer, but on the private sector. Uh, if is I may, there a second? Chair, uh, before we second, uh, it really is important to me that we, and I understand the, the definition of innovation, but that we truly talk about innovation, different ideas, things that haven't been tried, uh, that the private sector brings to the table that uh, isn't going to be done through our normal course of treating people. And, you know, 10 million seemed like a lot for me to put on the table. I agree that 5 million should be matched to that original five, but I would like to see some kind of follow-up if we're gonna move forward as to what some of these innovative ideas have been approved or going through the approval process to show us that this is in fact something different. And if we can get some um, acknowledgement of that, that we can oversee as a body where this money is going and that it actually is going to something where we, have, we would have never done if it wasn't for this fund, then, uh, then I'm there because I think it's a, it's a good idea. Um, Ms. Baker, my, my true belief is that when this is announced that we are starting down this path, you will see innovative ideas from across the country uh, and they will come in uh, to this body. And then I also believe that more money will be attracted. Um, we just cut the ribbon on a building at the Magnet headquarters. Our fundraising target was $5 million. When we cut the ribbon, we had raised $13 million. I truly believe that that will be exactly what you'll see here because people love innovation, new ideas, creativity, and this, I believe, will happen. And you're going to see ideas that you and I, I don't even have a concept of what it is. Right. I guess, <laughs> Councilman Tron, that, and no, no disrespect to anyone out here, I thought your ideas were, were outstanding, but I don't think that the ideas were innovative. I don't think that us trying to correct a problem within our hospitals is innovative. That's just something that better be done. And now that I know about it, I'm going to be looking into that even more so. And I don't know if communication, although I agree with it and should be done, if we're not doing it, we should be, is really part of the innovation of what we're talking about here. Innovation is something that we can't even imagine how it can make a difference with people who are addicted and without these funds, we never would have had an opportunity to try it. And try it means try it. That's innovative, you can lose, doesn't work. Go on to the next one, try another one. It didn't work. <coughs> Third time, maybe we struck something that was innovative, that saved lives, and we could never have done it if it wasn't for these innovative funds. That's the innovation I'm looking for in this project. And um, I've heard a little bit of it today, but. That's where I like to see this panel go, and I would like as an oversight of a body to see what exactly is being proposed and whether what was proposed worked as a true innovation of success that would not have happened if not for these phones. Mr. Okay, Chairman. so uh, I, 
I, I would just like to uh, say that it, that when this comes back for the contract, it, w it would behoove the administration to be very specific about what the monitoring, the follow-up, and, and, and to incorporate substantial elements of, of that in, into the process, and, and I expect they're going to bring that. Uh, I'm going to second the motion for $5 million and ask if there's further discussion before we vote on the amendment. Yes, sir, please. Okay, Ms. Stevens. I realize that I'm not part of this committee oh, officially, no, you're, you're, but thank you for inviting me and allowing me to speak today. Since a portion of this is the kind of life I live, uh, my colleague Mr. Schron and I have regular conversations about good business practices for council and for this county. Um, one of the things is that I um, did some work with Nottingham and Spurk years ago, and they helped me learn about how you do investments and why you do investments. And so at this point in time, what I'd love to see um, the county execs team do is negotiate something where our investment is rewarded by public investment, by private investment. And then one of the things I saw uh, when working with groups like Nottingham, Spurk, is the ability for us to generate some income off investments we help happen, have happen. And so if staff can discuss that in such a way we can make it legal with the law department, I'd love for that to be part of the long-term discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Tuma. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, I, I appreciate uh, Councilman Sh uh, Schron. And his and his um, um, help me out here. <laughs> well, yeah, his, his his comments. Um, so, with with that, my my thing here would be um, the advisory committee. We are not experts, but as as Councilwoman uh, Baker indicated, I I do uh, intend to continue to have some legislative oversight over this uh, program. Should it be um, moved forward, and uh, you know we want, we do want to make sure that our our, our um, Money is going towards projects that we do feel are innovative and helping people with this very important uh, is issue towards this important issue. Um, and uh, you know, lastly, I just want to say, Councilman Schron, I, I certainly appreciate your passion with this and and all the work you've done on this. And the you know, you understand we're coming where we're coming from is we're, we're as concerned and and passionate about it as you are. And um, we're working together, this is this is how you get things done. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, the question is uh, on the the amendment to uh, change the amount from ten million to five million. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The amendment is approved, and the question is now whether to approve the resolution as amended for second reading suspension for five million, and the clerk will call the roll. Calling the roll, Ms. Baker? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Tuma? Yes. Mr. Gallagher? Mr. Schron? Yes. Ms. Turner? Yes. The, res the resolution is recommended. Is there any miscellaneous business? Hearing none and there being no further business, we stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody, very much for hanging in there. We'll get that.